ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Morgan. I'm Arlington's environmental planner and conservation agent. The June 20th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with chapter two of the acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until March 31st, 2025. This meeting is being recorded and the recording may be made publicly available. All of the meeting materials that we will discuss tonight can be found at the link that I'm putting in the chat right now. Please note that the Zoom chat feature may be used for questions and comments that contribute to the commission's proceedings. And if it's used otherwise, it may be disabled at the chair's discretion. Mm -hmm. The public comment period will follow each hearing. Conservation Commission encourages attendees to ask questions and offer comments during the public comment period. Chuck Taroni, our commission chair, will facilitate this meeting. Each vote taken tonight will be taken with a roll call vote. And we begin with roll call attendance and Sure, we're going to start with that. Hey, so I'm going to, um, I've been having a little bit of connection problems. I'm going to shut off my video and see if that helps. Um, so I'm still here. I'm just uh, going to shut the video off. So I'm going to do a roll call attendance uh, first. So, um, well, actually, let me do the agenda first, and I'll take roll call attendance. Uh, so on tonight. Chuck, we lost you. If you can hear me. Hmm. Oh, well. Hey, Chuck. Video. Um, you. Chuck all together. Bear with Chuck, us. we lost you. Is he leaving and coming back? I think so. Okay. Susan, you want to do roll call vote? Yeah, yeah, so let's get going. So I'm going to do roll call attendance and then Chuck can review the agenda. Um, so Nathaniel Stevens. Present. David White. Here. Dave Kaplan. Present. Mike Gildesgame. Here. Um, Eileen Coleman. Eileen, I think you're on mute if you're there. Thank you there. Eileen's not answering, but I see it. Oh, no, Adrian. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get off something. That's okay, no problem. Sarah Alfaro Franco. Uh, present. Thank you. Um, Susan Chapnick is present and Chuck Taroni was present and will be right back. Did I miss anybody? Um, Brian McBride is out absent today. Um, he's in India. I, I guess he, he decided it wasn't hot enough here for him. So he had to go there. <laughs> All right. Um, if we can't get Chuck to... back in, um, David, you could go over the agenda. That's fine. By very me. quickly, just the, the highlights. And then, um, then we can start administrative. Thank you. No problem. Here is the agenda. Putting it up on the screen again, it's available at the link in the chat, which I will repost after I review here. So first up, we have a few administrative items. It's a very quick uh, few things, including minutes and correspondence, usual administrative stuff. We have one item on the administrative report, report about an update on FEMA's floodplain maps, and I will share those details when we get there move on to the discussion section where we have one hour for a presentation from our vendor team on the Mount Gilboa feasibility study. We'll have an update from the usual crews here, the Water Bodies Working Group, Tree Committee, CPA Committee, and Park and Rec Commission before we move on to uh, certificate of, for, sorry, Certificate of Compliance Request for Medford Boat Club, which will then bridge into a hearing on a notice of intent for the Medford Boat Club. 
There are three other hearings tonight, one for 49 Spy Pond Lane, another for Hamilton Road, and lastly, for Thorndike Place. And I will note uh, right up front, the hearing for Thorndike Place, if anybody's here to attend, you're of course welcome to stay on and follow the commission's business all the way through the meeting if you like, but we are intending to strictly vote on continuing that hearing to the July 11th meeting. So if uh, if you have other things to do with your evening, I would understand. That is it for the agenda review. I can move us right along into the administrative sections. Uh, Susan, that would be great, David, thank you. I'll take this down. And I will repost the link to the agenda materials. Just David, I would just point out that your volume is quite low as well. I'm very sorry. I have a new setup in my office and it is plaguing me with volume issues. So we have no meeting minutes for our past meeting to review. So we will pick that up at our July 11th meeting, including hopefully the meeting minutes for tonight. Uh, correspondence received, of course, is available in the meeting materials. I've just posted that link in the chat. And there was one letter from the Coalition to Save the Mugar Wetlands. Um, really no other correspondence received by the deadline to speak of. So I see Chuck's back, hopefully for good. And we just got through correspondence, Chuck. So I was about to go on to the administrative's report. Yes, exactly. Is that what you're on? Yeah. Okay. So uh, on our list, we have the administrative's report, which is a FEMA map update. And David Morgan will be addressing the commission about that. Right. Let me share my screen because I have maps to present to you. The Town was approached in June of last year by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, with updated flood data. They periodically review the accuracy of their data, which is regulatory um, and I believe statutorily binding for us in terms of our jurisdiction. And so this is kind of core information for us to have. This was summertime last year. We collected feedback via the form that I'm showing you right now, really received basically no feedback because the uh, revisions that we're allowed to submit is or, or were simply uh, clerical, let's say, correcting street names or you know, other kind of spelling errors, what have you. So I suppose for the benefit of the public, um, there are two, or actually probably three zones that you will see on these maps. One is the, what's called the 100 year storm, being a 1% one chance, 1 chance that your house will flood if you're in that zone in a given year. And then the 500 year floodplain is a 0.2% chance of the same thing occurring. We also have the floodway on these maps, and that's where water moves during a flood. If you can imagine a river in the midst of a flood, that's essentially what you need to envision when you hear the word floodway. So there have been fairly significant changes to the map. And Beneficially for residents, the data have been corrected and sort of more closely analyzed to determine that much of the area that was previously in the floodplain is no longer. So we're talking about areas where we no longer have jurisdiction more so than we're talking about areas where we now have jurisdiction. So this is the current flood zones map. Um, it's quite small. You can see this on our website if you want to go into more detail. 
there's the preliminary revised version of the same, which is completely unhelpful because you won't be able to tell what differences there are until I scroll down to show you this map. Um, can somebody give me a thumbs up if I full screen this? Are you able to see the entire map in a larger format now? Yeah, great. So on the left-hand side, we have the current flood map. On the right-hand side is the revised. So you can see much of the area here. Just take a second to sort of take in the various areas, um, the extent of them. And then you can see that, for example, areas down in East Arlington are lesser in their extent. And swipe further, you'll notice areas around Mill Brook being dialed back. The same thing to a lesser extent up in the Heights. This is the Arlington Coal and Lumber uh, culvert that is the first choke point on Mill Brook that spills over. It's also the area right next to Colonial Village where the brook is made to take a southerly right hand turn, 90 degree hairpin turn. And that engineering caused a whole ton of flooding to result from you know major storms and so forth. So that area is still certainly a problem, but you'll notice to a somewhat lesser extent based on FEMA's new estimates. So again, here is what's current. Kind of go slowly. I'm sure my internet's not really providing you the best bandwidth for taking this in. There is the, well, I suppose they're calling this the um, proposed version. The clincher is that we have been directed by FEMA to start using the proposed floodplains in place of our current floodplains. So any business that's currently in front of the commission needs to be evaluated using the map that you can see on the right hand side here and any forthcoming business is the same. There are no projects that are impacted by or that are before the commission currently that are impacted by these changes, but we should be aware that future ones will be affected. I'll be working with our GIS director to update these maps have them at hand for analysis and also to post them publicly eventually, you know, just as soon as they're refined and, and ready to get online. So I will stop there, stop sharing, and I see a lot of hands. So open the floor. Sure, let's go to David Kaplan first. Yeah, thanks. Um, I had a question. Do we have a sense what data is mostly is driving these changes? Um, is it better elevation data that they're uh, employing, or is it uh, different flood calculations from design storms? Combination of the two, I believe. So they refine their model, and they will get better elevation data, which is taken from aerials, and they also will refine the mechanics of their model to determine where they think flooding is likely to occur. I should also just tag on because it struck me that I didn't say this up front. This is relevant to residents in terms of their flood insurance. If you were in an area that was in the floodplain, determined to be in the floodplain by FEMA previously, and now is no longer, you may not have to carry flood insurance any longer, legally speaking. It might be your prerogative to still carry it, but that's your decision, and I can't advise you on that. I am not a lawyer. Okay, uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks. I think I just answered my own question. I was wondering what authority DEP has to require us to do this. Under the Wetlands Protection Act, I see an email from our circuit rider sent, alerting us to the these uh, 
updated maps. I guess they're not adopted, but they're preliminary maps. And the regulations do say the boundary of Fort BLSF is the estimated maximum ex lateral extent of flood water uh, as determined by reference to the most recently available flood profile data. So this is, I guess, these maps reflect that data. We we should just note, and I don't have my regulations handy, uh, just what it says under the bylaw, because I think we we say the most recently approved data, but we should double check on that. And I can try to I'm gonna try to run down and get my regs. They're in another room. Okay, Susan Chavnik. Oh, I, my video was off. Sorry about that. Um, I just had a question, David. You said that it doesn't affect any current projects, but we just did a site visit to 66R Dudley, which is in floodplain, and I did notice some of the Millbrook areas were pulled back, so it doesn't affect that property? That enforcement That's a order? a question. I only considered permitting Okay. I was describing. It might be something to look into. Um, because we are going to be considering at another um, meeting, subsequent meeting, restoration, and we want to see what the latest and greatest on the floodplain is. All right. Thank you. Helene Coleman, please. Um, <clears throat> David Morgan, when you say we've been told by FEMA, do you mean that Arlington received a letter? directly from FEMA, or are you just referring to Alicia's email? I'm just referring to Alicia's email. Okay, um, I asked this because I spoke to Nadia Madden today myself from DCR. She's sort of, they're the technical hand for FEMA. They are telling me that FEMA is not saying this, it's only DEP. Okay. DEP is saying that we can now use the preliminary flood chain maps um, to determine things under the Weapons Protection Act. However, under the building permits and so on, are still gonna have to refer to the old maps. So it's gonna be kind of complicated. And Nadia told me they're going to have a, because she, I'm not the only, a bunch of people called the to this week asking for clarification. They're gonna get together, FEMA's gonna get together with uh, DEP to try to clarify this for everybody so that we're all working from the same information. Okay. Thank you. That's very, I mean, that's pivotal information, critical right. to know. And uh, before I further advise anybody on their flood insurance, don't do anything. <laughs> don't insurance. do anything. She, she said, Alicia was super busy this week, but they're going to get together and we'll definitely be back to everybody in early July. Okay. So, hold up. So it is DEP saying that it's possible. Yes, it was only DEP. Right. Um, Nathaniel will be checking, but I do believe that we say the most recent and it'll be up to what we wrote at one point in terms of our regulations to determine if we necessarily use these data or if we wait for them to be approved. But it sounds like it is possible for us to use this information now. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, and I do think it says most recent also. I'm looking at it, but I don't have the ability to read all of that. So um, Mike Gildas game, I sometimes have a hard time seeing your hand when it's raised, but um, I just had a quick question. If we have a project currently underway in front of the Conservation Commission uh, and the uh, order of conditions for the uh, application uh, is based on the old maps. Is that going to be grandfathered in or will there need to be an update to those projects? Um, or Alicia's email says that it's subject, that even something before anything is pending, the, this data gets applied to it. So that would mean updating some projects, perhaps. 
the theoretically, process. yes, that's what she's saying. I'm not sure about that. I guess I, I don't know. I, if I were an applicant, I would argue it applies to the what was in effect when I uh, filed the application. Right. Okay. But she seems to be saying anything you can apply to any project and any pending notice of intent if the hearing is not closed. So we may have to decide on that. Um, just a preliminary look at the at the what David showed me. I do wonder if the Mugar of the uh, Thorndike Place property is affected. Huh. I, I hate to say that. I hate to open up that you know another aspect, and we're almost done with it. But so I think Thank it's important you. to get clarification from her on that. And I see that Steve Moore has his hand up. So before you uh, speak, Steve, uh, any other questions from the Conservation Commission? If not, and I see none, Steve, please unmute yourself. Uh, state your name, address for the record, and uh, speak. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I've I've got to say. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm just shocked at this. Is uh, it, this based on an intuitive sense and experience? This is not in accordance with what we see every year. I don't quite follow the idea that the floodplains are smaller and less prone, therefore, less of the town is prone to flooding. I just I, I'm I'm not even sure what to say. Uh, this this just really surprises me. And I guess my question would be to uh, Mr. Morgan is when they do their analysis of floodplain establishment or size management or whatever, they take into account altitude. They take into account uh, uh, mitigation that's occurred already to relieve past flooding, and. I'm assuming they take into account the most current NOAA plus plus weather data. Is that all correct, Mr. Morgan? Not necessarily the last point. They do use elevation data. I'm not sure which um, sort of design storm or sort of, you know what? It might just strictly be elevation based. Nathaniel, I saw you shaking your head. Do you have more information? Right, and and also David uh, Kaplan may know more about this as well. I don't, I don't know. I haven't heard that FEMA has adopted the NOAA data for their hydraulic analysis, uh, stream flow analysis. <laughs> but I think we'd have to look into that. And I also know that there is a community meeting. David's uh, David Morgan's email said that FEMA will be having a community meeting. Or the town will be having a community meeting to discuss these, and hopefully, I guess a representative from FEMA would be there to ask that. Uh, uh, Steve Morris, very good question about that. Well, I get. I uh, thank you, thank you for that. I, I guess, I would raise the issue of there's establishment of what a floodplain is, and then there's the problem of flooding. They're kind of separate because a floodplain is just where water collects. Flooding is a combination of where water collects and how much water is provided to that floodplain. And the storms that we're seeing clearly are more intense, clearly have more rain involved, clearly have more uh, uh, atmospheric disturbance. And I, the idea that the floodplain is smaller just doesn't make any intuitive sense to me at all, particularly when flooding is the problem. Now, maybe it's just my ignorance of how this works because I didn't, I didn't tune in to even hear about this tonight. I tuned in to hear about other parts of your always very interesting meetings. But I'm, just, I'm shocked because, you know, I know the idea of floodplain insurance and it being expensive is uh, the fact that the insurance may go away for a number of residents is a positive thing. Residents will like that. However, the idea of de having insurance because you might flood that's why you have it. This is not going to support that. So I just, I don't know. I'm flabbergasted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other questions from anyone attending tonight's meeting or the commission? If not, we're going to move on. Chuck, um, I'm sorry. Could could we just make sure that when um, David Morgan gets information about a townwide meeting on FEMA, that it goes on our website as well? Because it, it, um, 
you know, it's very interesting to us as well as the people who are present today. And to the commission too. Commission, right. Absolutely, David. I guess you heard that also. So, uh, okay. And with that, we're going to, we're going to move on. So we're going to try discussion items in the first item on our discussion items is the uh, Mount Gilboa feasibility study, 90% draft. And we have Martha Lyons, who is a landscape architect and community circle presenting their their draft findings or the recommendations for the Conservation Commission owned land at Mount Gilboa. My instinct is just to hand it over to Martha at this point, but David, I'm not sure if you wanted to say something first. If not, Martha. Yeah, I'll introduce sure. the project and Martha will say, of course, all of the more detailed points. So the Conservation Commission sought and received a grant from the Community Preservation Act Committee in fiscal year 2023 to conduct a feasibility study at Mount Gilboa to figure out sort of a vision for what the community, and that of course includes the town and other stakeholders, want to see happen at that property. It's a property up in Arlington Heights, which Martha will describe in much more detail for those who are unfamiliar, but um, feasibility study explored all options we now have, or all options that were presented during the sort of research, including historical uh, sort of conversations with current residents, conversations with town staff and decision makers, presentations to this body, and so on. So there's been quite a lot of research that Martha will summarize and quite a lot of engagement around this topic. So we have, we feel, done significant work to count all of the possible avenues for the future of Mount Gilboa. And so that's what you're going to hear about tonight. Martha will present we will go on to a brief Q&A session. We'd like to keep that to clarifying questions about the presentation and about the content of the report. I have a structured way of providing feedback on the 90% draft. So we're keeping this public engagement going for another week so that there can be feedback provided on the draft that Martha will present. I've received a number of emails already with thoughts about how to move forward, and I welcome you to use that form that I'll share with you after Martha's presentation to, to provide further feedback, all of which will be considered. So look forward to Martha's presentation and to hearing from you all. Without further ado, turn it over to Martha. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Happy Equinox. It's already um, starting to move towards shorter days. Never like that, but um, anyway, uh, I can share my screen, yes? Okay, I'm gonna do that. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, before I start this, I just wanna, uh, well, two things. One, I wanted to say that my, um, I, I worked on this project with a team, but my principal team uh, member is actually away. So Daphne Politis, uh, she handled all the public engagement for this process. So um, I'm pitch hitting a little bit for, for her, but um, so I wanna say that. And also uh, this has just been a great, um, you've been a great, commission to work with. I have to say, I just, I really enjoyed all of you. And um, so I'll be sad when the project's over, but thank you for all your help with this. It's been, uh, it's been quite an odyssey. Okay, let's see. So this project, as David said, um, is a, was a feasibility study. And what that means is that uh, we were engaged to um, see what was really feasible uh, for the future of this property. And I think uh, David stated this, but I'll reiterate what generated with this 
a whole study was really the issue with the, the house the garage because the house is at a point now where um, it can't safely be um, rented to tenants. And the town is having a difficult time uh, managing the upkeep and financing uh, just the upkeep of it, let alone uh, necessary improvements that need to be made. So um, that was kind of the, gener uh, the genesis of this. But along with that, of course, is the land that goes around the house, which is very much a part of uh, the study and a very critical part of this whole um, Malcoboa area. So we uh, established a goal. And I will say that this did go, did go through many iterations throughout the process, um, but I think that we've really came up with a good one that reflects what we did. And I'll just state this. It was to establish a community vision for Mount Gilboa to determine a future for the house and garage to make the property more accessible and to preserve it as a neighborhood and conservation asset. So with that in mind, um, just to reiterate who was involved, David was our great leader uh, at, on the plant from the planning and community development department. But again, I, I wanna again, thank all of you uh, for your help. And here's my consultant team. As I mentioned, Daphne, who was the head of headed up engagement. John Watney, who is a structural engineer based in Salem, who uh, special, specializes in historic buildings. And then Wendy Frontiera, who is an architect, but also a historian and helped uh, mine the information about the um, historical significance of the house. And I can't uh, forget, of course, some of the most important participants in this project were the residents of the neighborhood and also all the um, residents of Arlington. So thank all of you. I think some of you have seen this before, but I'll just reiterate what our process was. It was uh, four steps, and throughout the four steps, threaded through it, were many opportunities to uh, participate. Uh, so we ban began by doing research on the history of the property, preparing base information. And we, at that time, uh, met with the community, um, th through both a community-wide um, event as well as a focused community a conversation with the neighborhood. We also were engaged in assessment. I'm gonna be talking more about that tonight. Um, we looked at the regulations associated with the property, the existing conditions of the site, the landscape, and then also the conditions of the house and garage. And Along with that, we were able to conduct a number of what we call stakeholder interviews. Those are uh, conversations with individuals whose individuals have some sort of um, professional stake in the process. David mentioned town officials, folks who are in charge of money for the town, uh, people who take care of the property on an ongoing basis. And we conducted a survey, which is online uh, at the earlier part of this year that allowed for more focused feedback from a wider uh, range of um, individuals. And then from all of that, so the historical research, assessing what's going on there today, looking at the regulations and taking into account all of this feedback, we were able to come up with some uh, recommendations for the conservation to consider as they move forward with decisions about the property. And then part of our scope was to come up with um, some concepts as to how those recommendations and all of the information we gathered uh, could be um, actually translated into the land. Um, and all that information I think David mentioned is uh, posted online at the moment uh, as a draft uh, report and you will be able to, you participants today, tonight will be able to provide feedback using a, um, an online form. And then once this is all done, we will come put the final report together and we will be completed. Just to remind everybody, Mount Kilboa is 10.2 acres. Uh, it is one of the largest open spaces managed by the uh, Arlington Conservation Commission. And as you can see all the lines with inside this green, um, geomorphic shape, uh, there are eight parcels that make up the property and it contains the Lester Hayden house and the garage. Just 
to review once again uh, the engagement that took place throughout this process. Um, as I mentioned, we did a site walk with the neighbors as well as an interactive forum back in December. Also an interactive forum with residents from across the town. Um, there was a very active Mount Gilboa Crescent Hill neighborhood email thread, which we were allowed to um, take a look at and consider, uh, read through. And then we received a lot of individual email messages from uh, people who just had special interests or wanted to voice their opinions or um, talk about um, what they loved about the site. Um, Daphne also encouraged people to submit what we call six word stories, which are very short little narratives that depict people's uh, feelings or images of Mount Goboa. And then again, the survey that was conducted in January. And I think um, I'm going to talk to you about the vision that we put together for this property, but I think that um, this was one of the um, messages that was sent to us by one of the Crescent Hill neighbors. I think that really encapsulated the way a lot of people in Arlington and especially the neighborhood feel about this. And I'll just read this to you because I think it was so well written. Um, I enjoy just walking, wandering, discovering new paths, areas, views without signage to tell me where I am. It's wild and rocky and natural. I like watching huge oak trees grow, lose limbs, decompose over the years without human intervention, sit on rock ledges alone. And I have to say, I visited Mount Gabor through um, all seasons, actually, now that we're in summer. And um, I have to agree that there's a lot of what this person said um, that rings true for me as well. So this is the vision that we put together. Um, what we um, developed based on all of the input that we received. And this is just a vision for what we think the, the people in Arlington really would like to see in the future. One is a wooded conservation area with few alterations to its environment. Um, only those that encourage the health of existing plants and animal habitats and promote viability and proliferation of native plant and animal species. Second, to be a host to wide range of activities, including exercising, dog walking, safely walking to school, enjoying nature, experiencing quiet contemplation. Mount Goboa should be distinct from the private properties of abutting neighbors to the east, south, and west is marked by clarified property boundaries done subtly without compromising the woodland. Mount Gobo should be open to all residents, regardless of physical ability level, made possible by the provision of universal access to a portion of the property without significant intrusion on the natural landscape. And it should be litter and dog waste free as a result of a carry in carry out policy adopted by the town to eliminate littering, littering and improperly remove dog waste. It should be a commemorative site honoring Mount Gilboa's history as indigenous territory, as farmland, as part of a late 19th century subdivision, and as a private home. So with that, um, I want to talk to you uh, just briefly about our assessment of the buildings and landscape on the property, just to give you um, a clearer idea of how we came to our recommendations. And this is a very quick summary. The report goes into a lot more detail about this, um, including a whole appendix that contains the entire structural assessment. So people can read in detail about um, you know, what, what the condition of the house and garage are. So first of all, um, these are, are sort of the main points. Um, one is that the boundaries between Mount Gaboa land and that of the embodying neighbors to the east, south, and west are unmarked. And what happens with this is that because of this lack of clarity, uh, uh, users often will um, trespass onto private land. And this is just an image of a house that's on Alpine. And you can see how close the property is to the backyard of the house or side yard of the house. And it's just no clarification of where the property ends and begins. 
There are also many long views from uh, the rocky high points on Mount Gilboa, and those are really wonderfully enjoyed in the winter. In the summer, uh, there's a lot of growth of deciduous trees, and so some of those view sheds are obstructed. And opening them up, you know, could be a possibility if that was something that was desired. The commission has marked four trailheads with signage and one of them uh, contains a kiosk, it's off of Park Place. Um, but neither the signage nor the kiosk is well maintained and the kiosk lacks information useful to unfamiliar users. So there's room for improvement there. Uh, for all of those you know who use this property, there one of its greatest assets are the beautiful rock outcroppings and glacial erratic type boulders that appear throughout. And uh, while these are lovely and give the property great character, they do present challenges to pedestrians attempting to navigate the trail system. Also, the trail system does not contain blazers or blazes or markers to differentiate the level of difficulty. So what could happen to a person who has not been to the site and do, doesn't know anything about it, they could venture out onto a trail and end up being uh, confronted by trail conditions that is beyond their level of physical ability. So there's opportunity to amend that. The woodlands are dominated by oak and pine so much. Um, but the woodland, I would, I would say from a landscape architect's point of view, appears quite healthy. And that was confirmed by a recent study that was done by um, a, a, a townwide um, woodland study that was done. Um, and, but it does um, contain some invasive tree, shrub, vine, and herbaceous perennial in small patches throughout at the moment, these patches are manageable, um, but they will need continual monitoring and likely control in the future. Vehicles can enter the property now, and they do it uh, via the old driveway that leads up to what was the Thayer House. Um, this driveway is quite steep. And its conditions uh, in parking, uh, the, both the pavement of the driveway and the parking area at the top of the driveway are quite poor. Um, there's an issue with stormwater uh, coming down this uh, driveway in an uncontrolled fashion. And one of the other big problems with the driveway is that it, it has sends out a message to the public that this is private property, which it is not. And so that, um, seen as a bit of a, a problem that needs to be corrected. Regarding the buildings, um, John Watney, uh, the engineer, spent um, an entire day here looking at the exterior and the interior of the house and garage. And as I said, his report is quite detailed, but I will give you some of the highlights. The house itself um, is appears stable, although it does have multiple um, uh, indications of deteriorations, things like um, uh, mortar joints on the on the exterior, and uh, a lot of repointing that needs to happen, uh, cracks on the plaster on the inside and both the walls and the ceiling, which indicate likely water infiltration, but also could be some settling um, on inadequately sized um, beams. Um, the other thing is that the property. Uh, how, neither the house, the house near the, nor the stairway adheres to the Americans with Disabilities Act. So any type of improvements that would be made to this to um, allow a broad public use uh, would be um, required and, and actually quite difficult to make. One of the um, most concerning things that John pointed out was the stairway, which is in very poor condition. Um, he believes the town really should not be allowing people to be on it at all. It's that unstable and needs to be removed um, and or rebuilt. And then um, I specifically asked him to look at the um, notion as, of whether this house could be moved or not. And given the condition, 
The materials used in its construction, so not only the masonry exterior walls, but also the very uh, tall uh, fieldstone foundation, um, the steepness of the slope leading up to it, um, the lack of area, area at the top of the slope near the house to get equipment up there to actually move it, and then the, the getting it down the driveway and moving it um, through an urban area. It may not be feasible, in his opinion, um, and likely would be cost prohibitive. So that is a summary of our assessment. And as I mentioned before, so what we did was take all of the information we had collected from that and um, developed a set of recommendations. So I'll go through the, those with you now. There are nine of them. I think David counted them, saw, it was great. Um, the first is legal protection. And there, there was a lot of um, questioning about this when we did our community conversations, um, how protected is this property? And the commissioners themselves were not clear. Uh, so we did as much research on this as we were uh, able at this point. And it, it clear, it's clear that some of the acreage is clearly protected by Article 97, but some of it, it's a little fuzzy. And so um, that again is outlined in the report. Um, what we're recommending is that as the town move forward, they would want to get a clear re reading on that, excuse me, from, um, you know, a, a, a clear legal opinion about it. And uh, if it's protected, great. Um, if it never gets uh, resolved as to whether it's protected to not, I think the commission may want to move forward with placing a permanent conservation restriction on the land just to assure that protection um, one way or another. Uh, the edges, I think, do need to be somehow marked, and uh, there are several ways this can be done. Uh, one would be to use native materials, such as, as you see on the image on the left, just stone, stone cairns that are um, constructed in, a, in the shape that you see here, and those can be used to delineate property corners or property edges. I also know uh, uh, where I live, uh, our conservation lands, um, our conservation commission has just placed small round metal tags at the edges of the uh, land on the trees, very subtle. Um, you can see them, but they don't, they're not loud and they don't take over the woodlands. So that's important. Um, the trailheads, as I mentioned, are deficient. And I think that um, they do need to provide information about trail lengths and surfaces, widths, grades. And they're also an opportunity to provide information about uh, flora and fauna that is present at Mount Goboa. The trails themselves um, are pretty well established because so many people use them. But I think that one is, um, there is no designated accessible trail. And uh, one way to um, mark an accessible trail or trails of different um, levels of difficulty would be to establish a system of blazes. And then, then this can be done very simply. Sometimes you know, just paint and a spot on a tree is put, uh, put up. Sometimes small metal tags, such as this one from the Williamsburg um, Land Trust. So that would be something that would improve the experience of people who don't use it that often. Land stewardship, very important. Remote, remove and control invasive plant species. And then as new species are introduced, and if that is something that um, is desirable, we are recommending now that uh, species be selected based on their ability to survive in a warmer, wetter climate, just because um, we're facing that. Uh, regulation and disposal of waste, posting rules at the trailheads, providing dog waste bags at the trailheads, and also imposing fines for violating the waste disposal rules. Um, a carry in, carry out policy um, would be great. Wayfinding and interpretation. I mentioned the idea of commemorating the Thayer House um, one way or another. Um, but also the long history of this property uh, and the importance of the development of the town and all the people who have been associated over the centuries. 
beached, but a trail a uh, wayfinding program could also orient visitors to parking, uh, to the trailheads and trail lengths and degree of um, di difficulty, et cetera. Um, again, a Lester Hayden House commemoration would be um, a very important thing to do, uh, regardless of what happens with the house. You know, some side, type of sign or marker with a QR code that um, visitors can access photographs, historic photographs, and information relating to the site's history and the house's history. And connections. I think um, it was interesting when David showed the overview of the floodplain map. Um, you know, Michael Monkable is in somewhat of an urban island. Uh, it is surrounded by, you know, a very um, well-developed neighborhood, and it isn't connected to directly to its nearby open spaces, including the reservoir, uh, Whipple Hill, as you consider Turkey Hill part of that, maybe even the Arlington Ar 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 Great Meadow. Um, so one way of making those connections, and those are important uh, for the wildlife species to move about, um, would be creating tree-lined streets and pocket parks and sustainable stormwater systems on the routes that lead out of M Mount Goboa to those other open spaces. And that would be something that would be done in the long-term planning for the town, uh, open space planning. And then Daphne is very much in encouraging continued engagement. Uh, student engagement, um, as I mentioned, the, the students from the Pierce Elementary School use Mount Goboa as a route to school. And I think involving them in related uh, in plan planning efforts long-term would be very important um, and also, to get students more involved in uh, using Mount Gobo as an outdoor classroom. And then just continuing general public engagement. Um, we know how many people in uh, Arlington love this property and care about it and wanna be involved in, in it in the future. And any way that that can uh, be facilitated and there's many ways that can be done and some are listed here, I won't name them. Um, we're urging the you know, the commission and the town to pursue that. So that's the nine re general recommendations. And these apply to uh, any concept that the town decides to pursue in the future. But part of our scope was to see how we could make these um, recommendations and uh, the results of all the engagement and the history part of um, something visual. So I, we came up with three concepts and I wanna say there's no reason to um, choose one of these. I think that uh, a, some kind of a hybrid could be um, created um, or something entirely different, but this is based on all of our research that we've done and what we've heard. So the first is a concept, we've called this the wilderness area. And what this, um, property is focusing on is preserving the property's wild characteristics. So in this concept, the house and garage and driveway would be removed. So either um, demolished or relocated if possible. And so that would mean taking up all of these impermeable services that are associated. And if you can see my mouse, you know, it's all of this driveway, all of the area around the garage, all of the asphalt that surrounds um, there's an island, um, and then, of course, the cavity for the house. And just reclaim that. We call it, we're call we calling that rewilding now in the profession because it's essentially allowing it to become wild again. And that would increase, um, you know, the wild area by almost an acre. So it would be a, a great asset um, if the town chose to make this more of a wilderness area. And in the rewilding, uh, planting of native trees and shrubs um, could take place. We've also made a small parking area uh, off of Park Place. And this is near the area where some of the residents who live on Park Place park their cars, but it's on conservation land. This is a, one of the flatter areas of the site. And what this does is it allows to, um, the town to get some the cars off of the street. Um, a lot of the residents were concerned about people parking on Crescent Hill Avenue and Park Place um, to use the property. And it, it just clogs up these very narrow streets. 
So this small parking area would allow for a few folks to park and then we would provide two um, ADA compliant handicap spaces. And from the parking area, a trailhead, and then a very gradual meandering path, ADA compliant, that would lead up to a very formal, informal viewing area yet to be defined um, below the summit. Um, having a viewing area on the summit would be very difficult because it's uh, very rocky. This is kind of a level area that's there now. So it's a very, um, it's a, it's a very uh, non-invasive approach um, if you consider, um, if you don't consider the house and the garage being uh, integral to the property. So that's the wilderness area. The second concept is um, we're calling the overlook. And the emphasis in this is on enhancing the views from the high points um, and providing universal access to, uh, to individuals um, to those points. In this concept, um, the house and garage are also removed, but instead of removing the driveway, we've utilized that. Um, it has to be rebuilt and the stormwater situation has to be controlled, but it allows us to create a parking area in place of the garage. And that parking area would have a couple of regular spaces and then two ADA compliant handicap spaces. And then again, a meandering walkway, <clears throat> which could lead up to an overlook structure because this property is zoned as open space and uh, recreation purposes are allowed. Having a, um, an open air structure that would provide a little bit of shade and help frame the views and allow people to gather, I think would be in line with that zoning. Um, definition, and then a small footpath leading to the very top of the summit. And along with this, if desired, some selective clearing of the woodlands could be made uh, to open up some of the long views. And then the third concept is what we're calling the private home. And the, this, this concept uh, emphasizes retaining the historic home and, and at the same time preserving conservation land. So with this, um, the house itself uh, stands on, remember I said there were eight parcels in this property. One of the eight parcels, which is 1.795 acres. And it's uh, in this image, the image in, in orange and in the kind of yellowy, yellower -y green. That's the entire parcel. So this would essentially divide that parcel in half. So you would have two nine-tenths of an acre parcels. And the parcel in orange, which is fronting Park Place, would be sold as a pro to a private owner. So that would allow the town to uh, retain the house. Um, and it would uh, generate from some re revenue for the town. And it would allow, you know, the rest of the land to be uh, conservation land. And, you know, we realize that there are several issues related with this. I mean, one of them is just that the house sits on the highest point on the property. And so that would become private. Uh, it also would in probably increase the problem of uh, trespassing on private land because now you would have a private land, um, a tooth of private land uh, taken out of the larger conservation area. But um, it would um, allow the house to be saved in, in its location. And the maintenance issues uh, would no longer be the um, problem of the town. Um, so in terms of money, it's, uh, you know, it has some advantages. So we are in the process of wrapping up this project. Uh, we would like to residents to please um, submit your comments to the town no later than June, whoops, 27th. David uh, is posting a comment form on the town website, uh, which will ask some specific questions that will be very helpful for us in making any changes in this. And our goal is to finalize the report by July 5th. And then from then on, the commission um, we will be handing it over to them and the commissioners will be evaluating feedback, comparing concepts, consulting with town stakeholders, considering funding opportunities for concept development if desired. And with that, I will thank everyone.
And um, I believe that the commission would like to uh, discuss and then open it up for questions. Sure, thank you, Martha, for that wonderful presentation. I really appreciate all the different um, thoughts that you put out there for people to discuss. And um, so we have, uh, you know, something in front of us. I expect there to be a lot of conversation tonight about what we just heard, but I wanted to keep this to an hour and there's just 20 minutes left. So we're gonna do our best to get to everyone. But if we don't get to you, please fill out David Morgan's comment form. And I heard that he was gonna put it right in the chat now. And that's the best way to uh, make your comment about this project. Any comments made uh, now, when you voice your opinion, when we call on you, we'll of course go on to the, um, into our meeting minutes, but to get them right into David's uh, form and so it can be evaluated, it would be his comment form. So with that, I'm gonna see if anyone, can you just take down the uh, presentation for a second so I can see who's gonna raise their hand, uh, Martha? And then any commissioners with any questions at this moment? I see Nathaniel Stevens raised his hand. I'm gonna go with Nathaniel. Thanks, Chuck. And, and Martha, thank, thank you and Daphne for your, all your great work. Uh, the report looks, looks great. Um, and I appreciate every, all the hard work you've done. Uh, there's a, a lot to figure out on this. And although you weren't able to answer all the questions, I think you've certainly provided a good pathway for us to try to get answers to those remaining, remaining uh, threads that are hanging out there. I guess this is more a question for Chuck. It, what do you anticipate the process to be? We'll have some comments tonight, but when, and then I guess the report will be finalized and submitted on July 5th, and then the commission will, when will the commission sort of make a final decision about the recommendations in the report? Once the, uh, I expect it would come back to the commission once it's finalized for our vote, and then we would uh, pass that on to the select board. Uh, and before that, we might run it past some other boards first, but but eventually get to the select board. So okay. any comment should be in prior to um, the final draft. But I'm going to turn to David Morgan just in case he wants to add anything to what I just said. I think that covers it. Um, you know, it's the commission's prerogative, it being their land to pursue or not pursue any of the recommendations within the report. And the timeline is likewise open to the commission's discretion. Thanks. Sure. And with that, I'm going to go with David White. Uh, David, you're muted. Yeah. I think it's a very good and thorough comprehensive report. And my preference is for maximize public use of the land as conservation area. I think that's what it should be. And that's where I stand at the moment. Thank you. Mm. Great. Any other comments from commissioners? Seeing none, I had one comment um, and I'll just address the private home. Uh, and I also have an opinion, uh, but uh, on the just looking at its face value, the private home, I noticed that if you sold off that lot to a private developer or whoever would buy it, that you didn't think about um, parking with that lot. And I was wondering before you, maybe the concept could be shared parking. The driveway has a turnoff that that would go towards parking spots and then a, and then a um, path into the conservation land. So the entrance is the same, dual use of the driveway, driveway up to get to the house, but there's a parking spot for any visitors. Um, maybe that could be added in or thought about because parking's always needed anytime you have open space. And with that, I'm um, not looking for an answer, but with that, I'll want to turn it over. Not seeing any commission questions, but anyone here tonight that would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, we'll get to you. So far, seeing none. Let me go over here. No hands raised um, from anyone attending tonight's meeting. 
Oh, uh, Susan Doctorow is, uh, please uh, just unmute yourself, introduce yourself for the record and speak, please. Hi, <laughs> um, I'm Sue Doctorow. I already sent you a letter um, voicing my objections to the private home idea, so I won't get into that right now. But what I, but I'll, you know, I'll reiterate it in the responses. But um, I just wanted to address the um, uncertainty about Article ninety seven protection. Um, as you probably remember, in two thousand sixteen, there was a town meeting warrant article to to transfer the house to the Arlington Housing Authority, and um, at the time. Doug Heim, the town council, told me that um, he he reviewed the town meeting records of when the land was purchased, and he was a very strong opinion that that the parcels under Article ninety seven restrictions. So, for what that's worth, um, that's what he said. Um, and I thought there was a discussion of fixing the deed. Maybe does David White remember that it was discussed at the time? I, I vaguely remember that now that you mention it. And we were going to reach out to town council and hopefully the current town council will have Doug's thoughts on that. Hopefully he put that in writing. Yeah, <laughs> he did. I have the email. <laughs> oh, okay. Or, um, or a memo. Oh, okay. Yeah, if, you have, yeah. if you have the email handy, please send yeah. it to David Morgan. Definitely. Because that, that'd be helpful. Yeah, and it was so February 2016. And Adam Chapdelaine was CC'd. Um, so anyway, with that in mind, my understanding is that to sell the land to a private party is quite an onerous process. <laughs> um, is that fair to say? Town meeting, a vote of the legislature. Um, so for what that's worth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if we find out that it's Article 97 conservation land, we the Conservation Commission hasn't turned over land since I've been here. I wouldn't expect that to be high up on anyone's list. Thank you. It, it's only if it's not and it's private at this moment and it somehow belongs to the town of Arlington. Uh-huh. And the town has the will to do that. Um, so can I just ask one more question, throw one more thing out? I'm actually favoring like um, right now concept, the first concept, but I talked a little to Clarissa Rowe and she thought too that this might be possible, is if the house was to be preserved, but the town doesn't want to operate it, is it possible to have a, like a 99 year lease um, to somebody like the Housing Corporation of Arlington? I have no idea if they want this, but um, that they could repair it and operate it as affordable housing, um, kind of a quiet residence the way it's been before. So uh, again, I don't need answers now, but I'm just throwing that out as something that might be possible so that the town would not be giving up the land, but the house would be leased to a party to operate it in some favorable manner. Um, maybe with requirements that the land could be available to the public, you know, like the overlook area. Anyway, that's all I want to say. All right. Uh, thank you for that. And moving right can along. I, can I just uh, respond to a couple oh, of sure. things? Oh, sure. Sure thing. Right um, well, one is that I just, um, there are multiple deeds associated with this property. There isn't just one deed. Yep. And um i did have i did send the deeds to um uh eeo ea the environmental um executive office of environmental affairs to review and they um they of course you know stipulated they are not lawyers but they did say that um their reading of it was that because these these properties were through town meeting um, assigned to this, the Conservation Commission that kind of automatically would qualify them as being protected under Article, Article 97. But, you know, I don't have anything definitive from that yeah. about it. No, but that's yeah. promising because that's consistent with what Doug said. Yeah. Um, it was based on town meetings um, procedure when they bought it, the, the minutes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it may be um, the town, you know, Article 97 was passed in 72, I think. So it, it was uh, probably, it didn't seem to be that well-defined when it was passed. So there were a lot of details yeah. about it. Maybe more okay. worked out. Um, okay, yeah. thank so, you. Thanks for telling us that. Okay, uh, thank you. And thank you for that uh, answer. So uh, Anne Ellert, please unmute yourself and identi uh, identify yourself for the record, please. Anne, uh, David, could you make me co-chair and uh, see if you can uh, unmute Anne? Both are done. It says in the chat that Anne cannot unmute. Yep. You get a couple options. You can make her co-chair, and then, then it's going to work, or you can unmute her. Let's try making chair also can't turn on video or she could call in try try now um lower it's probably going to be the lower left hand corner of your screen that you're looking for the mute and video is it chatting from a chat Okay. And you might try to leave and rejoin quickly. See if you're able to reset your Zoom settings. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from her too, but I'm a little hesitant about making anybody but a commissioner a co-chair. So kind of not in favor of that. Yeah, it's... it's it... Co-host, yeah. <laughs> Co host, I mean. co host, co chair. Is yeah, it co chair? Co chair. Co -chair. Co well, we're gonna whatever we're it gonna, is. We're gonna get people to talk tonight, and somehow okay. we'll we'll get there. Okay. Yeah. Zoom I, Dave, it looks like Dave Dave Kaplan has a comment. Sure, Sorry. Dave, please. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll fill in the time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, just um, you know, just my quick read on you know, I guess looking at the two concepts that remove the house. Um, I like the idea of, of concept A uh, because a little bit better than B because it puts the parking in an area that would be easier to manage from a stormwater perspective and from salting and, and other access. And then it rewilds the sloped area um, to stabilize that and sort of mitigate some of the stormwater runoff the site's currently uh, realizing. And also, I do like the elements of B that could potentially be incorporated, uh, the overlook structure and the footpath to summit. I think improving the views and access um, could be good to consider uh, and, and as, as part of concept A. So my, my two cents for what they're worth. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, so let's go back, and I see um, I see Sue Doctorow again. Is that uh, is that who we have here? Just please, uh, I see your hands raised. Please talk if you would like to say something else. Hi, this is Anne. Thanks for your patience. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was able to unmute and get my video on. And thanks for the thoughtful report. Um, I want to say, first and foremost, there was a really thoughtful process with the neighborhood meetings um, in December that I went to, and I just really encouraged the commission to um, listen to what people said, because the sale of the house really goes against the really strong community feeling. And even if that land is not protected by Section 97 on the house, and it sounds like it might be, I really encourage the commission to protect it long-term with section 97 and to not sell the house. Um, I do have a question. Um, I also wanted to say too, um, there was concern over parking um, with this piece of land, but I, I don't live, I don't know about the land, but I know the people that live close by were really concerned if it turned into a community center, which was one of the options talked about in the December meetings that there would not be parking for that. And that would 
you know, create issues on the street. So I'm not sure it's necessary to put parking in the conservation land. I just wanted to put that thought out there because the concern was really if it was, you know, artist studios or a nature center that there would be parking and traffic issues on the streets. Um, my question, I have two questions really that there was something in the presentation about how there's rocky outcroppings and boulders that interfere with use of the trails but also acknowledgement that that's part of the beauty and what people like. Is there, I didn't see anything in either of the three options on getting rid of rocks boulders. Is that true that there's no plan to change these things? Cause I don't find them intrusive in using the land. Yeah, I think that um, there's not, uh, I don't think that there's a reason to based on public input and also just um, the nature of natural you have the site to remove. There are plenty of places to walk on Mount Goboa that don't have, don't have those obstructions in them. Um, but it's just, I think, but it's important to share with the public what is walkable and what's more difficult. And I will say that um, admitting that uh, when I started this project, I was suffering from a very bad ankle break and I navigated the site about a year ago, uh, limping and it was tough. So um, yeah, so I think that um, it just, more information for people so they don't get caught out there. Um, having to scale up boulders would be helpful. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Are you, are you all set? Uh, because I don't want to uh, yeah. cut you I off am. early with all the hard time you had. Uh, get, <laughs> I, getting... am. I am. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, great. Uh, Steve. Uh, Steve will be our last, uh, last person we're going to take. Just you have to say your name and address for the record again, Steve, but go ahead and speak. Sure. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, this is a magnificent property, and it sounds like it's one of the jewels in the crown, so to speak, of um, the Conservation Commission. So I think it does warrant your, uh, your very careful consideration here, which it sounds like it's going to get. That was a great presentation. Um, I, I guess... Uh, I'm not sure that this is an appropriate place to try and put affordable housing. It just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense from an access standpoint. It doesn't make a lot of sense from a renovation standpoint. I mean, the building, although at one time you can tell it was probably a pretty magnificent house is, is not anymore. And uh, it, it would just, it would just take such significant work to make it accessible, useful, up-to-date, functional, uh, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it sounds like that's why it's only, you know, one of the multiple options is to do that. The idea of, of selling it to private house makes kind of zero sense to me. Uh, since again, this is a, a unique set of pro a property with uh, probably the largest chunk of open space uh, is sort of available for this sort of natural use that I can, I can think of in town. Uh, so maintenance of the same is probably good. I, I also, I guess I would offer that um, trying to create a balance of accessibility against wildness is going to be tricky here. Um, it's, it's appeal to my mind anyway, is in its wildness. Um, if you make it all ADA accessible, you will lose that. And I think that would be a mistake. I don't, I know that you have legal considerations to, to, um, to think about here, but uh, if there was some option to make a part of it perhaps accessible that way is fine. But trying to make a significant amount of it accessible that way, I don't, I don't think is such a such a fine idea, um, because it is so wild and and so unique this way. Um, so I guess I would just just off, offer that up. This does look like a magnificent opportunity, and what looks to me to be a perfect. Uh, a perfect uh, candidate for a CPA grant. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chair. Great. Okay, so I'm going to turn it back to the commission at this point and cut off public debate. And again, we have uh, the form that David Morgan would like people to fill out, uh, and maybe that might be easier anyways. Uh, so fill out the form. It's the comment form. It's uh, David... Uh, put it in the chat already, but if you have any problems, uh, please reach out to David at the office. And there it is again. Um, reach out to David at the office. He's uh, he's invested in this project and I'm sure he'll do what it takes to uh, get your comments on the record. 
And with that, um, I'm just going to see if Martha or David would like to have some closing statements, and then we must move on to our next agenda item. Martha first. Um, just, I want to thank the commissioners again. And also, I do think that um, no matter what you decide, and I want to say, you, as I reiterate, you don't have to pick one concept. Um, there are just a lot of ideas to consider, and they could all be mixed up. But it is such a great opportunity, especially if you decide to go rewild part of it. Such a great opportunity to um, just, you know, introduce the public about that whole concept. Um, and the other thought that I just wanted to mention is if you do decide you want to put some type of a structure at the top for viewing, um, that would be a great project for, um, you know, a class of architecture students to design and actually construct that. Um, so there's an opportunity there, you know, maybe with some of the architecture schools in the area. So there's so much more, but it's late. So thank you again. Well, I'll reiterate Martha's gratitude. I think that this has been a deeply engaging process. I'm very grateful for all of the input that people have provided and I look forward to getting more in the coming week. Um, as we covered at the outset, the Conservation Commission will be the body to decide on pathways forward and a time frame for that. Um, we'll have subsequent con subsequent conversations to which I hope you will attend and participate and uh, look forward to talking with you then. So thank you again. All right, yes, thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Martha Lyon, for putting this together. Okay. And with that, we're going to move on to our next discussion item. And that's a Water Bodies Working Group uh, update from David White. Two items. The water chestnut harvesting is started at the reservoir. Go on through next week. We also discovered algae at Spy Pond and Hills Pond. And David may have more to say about that. David, or not? The uh, algae at Hills Pond was assessed by our vendor, Water and Wetland, who manages that water body. They've deemed it filamentous and not cyanotoxic, uh, which was the kind that would be a threat to public health and the kind that makes us put up all the signs and say, don't let your dog drink the water, don't go near the water, et cetera. So we are having a lab assess a water sample that was taken Monday in order to determine whether there are sufficient levels of cyanobacteria in the water to have led to a bloom of that kind of algae. Um, in just a couple of days time, we'll have an assessment of that in the coming days. And uh, again, the early assessment is that's not harmful algae it's unsightly, but it is normal and nothing to, to be concerned about until we say don't go in the water. If we say don't go in the water, i.e. the Board of Health, then don't go in the water. How about Spy Pond? Um, we have not had Spy Pond assessed for algae. I just saw Brad's, um, Brad Barber, who provides us with reports on Spy Pond. Um, I just saw his note this afternoon that there was algae reported. We'll need to look into it further in order to figure out the kind and extent and so forth. And as always, Brad has eyes on the water and we're very cautious about that because it is a more recreational water body with the rowing club and others who use it than mm. probably any other. So we'll put close eyes on it. So David, those were the two sites that you mentioned? Yes. Hills and Spy Pond. Okay. Chuck, um, may I make one comment? Um, sure. I would really hope, David Morgan, that you get out there or have somebody get out to Spy Pond. Um, because though it we do rely on, you know, updates from the spy from Spy Pond from Brad, he is not going to assess what kind of algae it is. And if Board of Health goes out there and just visually says, close it, it's algae, then we're in trouble without even assessing it. So uh, 
what is our mechanism? I know for hills, we've got water and wetland. What is our mechanism for Spy Pond? Can we get SWCA to get water and wetland out there or how do we do that? Right, water and wetlands, the vendor who does that work anyway. So um, when they have eyes on Hills Pond, we can get their eyes on Spy Pond. They'll be in town and I can make a special request that they go to look at Spy Pond. That would be great. And the area where Brad said, because actually I was down there the other day with Chuck on another site visit, and it did look a little greenish around that Alfred Road um, area. Yeah. So um, it would be good to check it out. In the corner of Princeton and Alfred. Yeah. That's where we were. Yeah. Thank That'd you. That'd be great. And then just so uh, everyone knows, where is this going to be posted? On the town website, on the conservation page, it would be some sort of community alert. Uh, the Board of Health would issue the restrictions and they post signage at the site. That's really the first place to look for it. Um, they'll do their own outreach when they issue a, a, a restriction like that. If it's, Okay. Yeah. And I, I will be in the loop and I will make sure that it hits the usual channels to notify people if there is a closure or a restriction. So again, we'll we'll make sure it's monitored. Okay, David, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to a tree committee update it's from Sarah Farrow Franco. Uh, yes, uh, the, um, the tree committee met last Wednesday, June 12th. Um, and a couple of things. Um, they discussed the back of sidewalk program that I didn't know what it was. And uh, it basically the town will purchase and plant a tree on private property uh, within 20 feet of public right of way. Uh, the goal is to expand tree plantings in Heat Island. Uh, the, the owner is responsible for watering and maintenance once the tree is planted and it becomes the the uh, the property owner owns the tree after one year. Uh, this program does not apply to private streets. Uh, other eligible properties are apartment owners, businesses, churches, schools, single and multifamily residences. Um, in addition, they also mentioned that DPW has hired two people to go around town and water trees using one truck. And the tree committee, again, continues to encourage the public to be kind to young town trees and to water them one to, once or twice a week. Uh, next tree committee, uh, tree meeting committee is scheduled for July 10th. That was great, Sarah. Uh, any questions? Okay, moving on. We, this is, there's no uh, update. So Park and Recreation, uh, the next meeting, June 24th, 2024. And Susan Chapnick will attend that meeting. So their last meeting was canceled. And so this is actually the next meeting the Conservation Commission is going to attend. This is June 24th. Okay. Now, in discussions F, we have the Medford Boat Club. And so I'm not sure who's here for that. So maybe that can get set up. Uh, just gonna set the set the discussion up. So we have a request for a certificate of compliance. The Conservation Commission has received a certificate of compliance checklist from David Morgan, our conservation agent. David points out that the applicant has completed um, with all aspects of the order of conditions, except for number three, the applicant has failed to show that they have taken steps towards creating a collaborative group to formulate uh, to formulate a lake management plan. A notice of intent in 2018 paperwork, the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries (DMF) recommended that the uh, development of a conservation cons comprehensive uh, management plan. And so uh, we don't see this plan. We're looking for some questions about this plan and how we can move forward. Um, I believe maybe Dominic's here from uh, from uh, Solitude Management. Is that who we have or who's here from Solitude? I think it is Tanner Poole. Tanner. 
Oh, hey, Tainer, how are you doing? So, Tainer, uh, can you introduce yourself for the record and bring us up to date with your request for a certificate of compliance, order of conditions number 91-0296? Uh, yes, um, I'm Tanner Poole. I'm associate manager at uh, Solitude Lake Management. Um, as far as the question about the certificate of compliance, um, like you said, we follow pretty much, I believe we believe we followed every condition except for condition three and that was for the client to reach out to other people in the lake and to come together to form a management plan um we spoke with a lot of the people at the boat club and in their remembering of what happened they remember at the time reaching out to a lot of other people but kind of just never came together completely as far as like them coming up with a plan together for everybody to you know agree upon and that kind of just never came to fruition. So we kind of don't have too much more on that. Okay. Um, again, this is a request for a certificate of compliance, which had a two year span. Uh, and okay, so Susan Chapnick, yeah, please uh, ask some questions here. Okay. okay, first of all, I think it would be helpful um, for David to put up the conditions that were on, there were only what, five conditions or whatever um, that was in the order of conditions on one of the pages of the order of conditions. So that would be helpful. The next is- Page 15. I, yeah, I think that's it. I I didn't get, um, I, I guess I'm missing David Morgan's checklist review or review of the, for the certificate of compliance as you mentioned at the outset, Chuck, I didn't see on that. Google Docs. I, I met, oh, it's on Google Docs and I don't, yeah. I was I was looking at the one on um the one online. So I guess I missed it. It it's not in the public um documentation that I saw. But anyway, um I disagree that they met all the other requirements um other than number three. Um I I Want, really wanted the Water Bodies Working Group to review the monitoring reports to see if they were compliant with the conditions. I believe they are not. Um, the conditions requested that monitoring be done um, bi-weekly prior to, during, and after the treatment. And the monitoring was only done the day of treatment and then after treatment, not not before treatment. Um, so they they weren't done at the right frequency in, in my opinion. Um, and then I'm I'm a little concerned with the th the third year monitoring, which showed um that um kind of a a decrease in from from previous years of dissolved mm -hmm. oxygen and um the SECI depth was also decreased. Those show to me some impairment. I am not a, a, an aquatic scientist, so I'm just looking at the years to years. But I guess my concern is that we didn't get these reports every year. The Conservation Commission was supposed to get these reports, and we did not. So that that was that was not a compliant. And then I the monitoring doesn't seem consistent with what we asked for. And I hope David Morgan can find that page so he can put it up and we can actually look at it without me just spouting off. Um, so yeah, there we go. Okay. So the DO monitoring, oh, it's in the, it's in the 718 letter. So it's not listed there. The 718 letter has the- I think uh, it's at the top, MC. the top of that uh, download right there, David. So if you scroll up, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the first page. Yeah. No. Okay. So it says the frequency. Um. DF DMF. So it's the one, two, three, four, fourth bullet recommends monitoring biweekly before, during, and after treatment in order to detect changes in plant vegetation and fish use. Um, so, so solitude did measure dissolved oxygen and secchi depth. They did not um, see river herring. That was in a narrative. Um, so anyway, 
I mean, I hate to hold up this whole project and I understand that we may consider giving a certificate of compliance with these notes that there were some deviations that we would not accept in the future when we do a future permit. Um, but I just wanted to point those out. All right, thank you, Susan. Uh, mm -hmm. So Mike Gilt's game, I can see your hands up. Yes, indeed, thank you. I just wanted to clarify whether bi-weekly in this case means every other week or twice a week. Because it can be either way. And I don't think it's clear in that statement. So there may be something else in a piece of text somewhere that clarifies that. But David, I don't know if you know the answer to that or, or Tanner, maybe you know the answer to that. I don't know. But the other question I had was regarding uh, number three, the comprehensive lake management plan. Uh, I, I understand that uh, you reached out to a number or the boat club reached out to a number of areas and uh, there are multiple lake management plans available for an example. And I think folks like Mr. River Watershed and other folks who are involved with water resource management uh, both at the state and the uh, local level would probably be interested in this. Uh, I don't think it has to be a, you know, a 200 page document, but I think it needs just to look at the issues. And uh, so I would, I would hope that this plan when completed would deal with all the issues that we're just talking about now and that are in the uh, order of conditions. I don't have further clarification on that, Mike. The letter doesn't elaborate to clarify that point. It's just important to know because that makes a big difference in what they're doing. Mm. Any other questions or concerns about uh, what we've been going over here for the Medford Boat Club? I add one more. Um, were these reports so these reports were submitted to the Medford Boat Club, obviously. Were they submitted to DMF? Do you know, Tanner? Um, not I know you're knowledge. just filling in, so you don't know who yeah. you are. Okay. I mean, yeah, to not to my knowledge. Okay. So that's important also because DMF want this is this is a very important herring run. And um they wanted the data to see what's happening. Um and they they look at data from lots of different herring runs and other fish um, in the state. So it is important to get them that information. Uh, Susan, what bullet point is that? I'm looking, I understand number four is that they are recommending biweekly, um, but where does it say send it, send that information to DMF? I thought it was in the letter, no? It's not? I'm. Yes, I'm looking for it. That's why okay. I asked you. Yeah. Oh, maybe I was mistaken. I thought they were supposed to send it to DMF and the Conservation Commission as well as the. At the end, they just do that blurb that with these above conditions in place, you know, there's not going to be any harm. So we, you know, go ahead and issue the order of conditions. It doesn't say in that that they want to that see they the want the data. So maybe yeah. I'm mistaken there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we wanted we wanted the data. Yeah, I, I, I do see that there was kind of a breakdown here where this information is good and we have people that can review the information for the commission and give updates. And so I think it is a little concerning that the information was available but never got to the Conservation Commission. And then um, I guess as far as reaching out and trying to create a collaborative I understand that might be more challenging than, uh, you know, just kind of saying that in a letter. And I'm going to turn this over to David Kaplan, who I see that your hand's up. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. I was looking through the letters and the order, and it looked like the our condition is pointing back not to biweekly treatment, but to a proposed one day after treatment, two day after treatment, a seven day after treatment, and a four day, 14 day after treatment monitoring program that um, Solitude proposed uh, contingent on DMS review and approval of it. So I just want to offer that as a point of clarification and 
please correct me if I'm wrong. So the so Dave, um the way you read it, it's pointing back to something, a counter proposal by solitude. So I may not have read everything in order or missed something there because it's been a while. Um 718. But but the way you read it is solitude gave a counter proposal and that's what this is this is pointing back to not right right because yeah. i think dmf originally wanted uh continuous monitoring right. and correspondence there was some resistance to that um from a budgetary perspective and uh they countered with something a proposal that they say that dmf has approved in the past for other projects okay and, and that was you know outlined in their letter um, that I just referred to. And then we didn't get another letter from DMF saying this this change is acceptable. Right. Yeah. So okay. we didn't we don't have follow-up with DMF approving okay. that. Um, but mm. us as the commission sort of I guess said it was okay. Okay. It. That, that that wasn't clear to me. So then their monitoring reports were acceptable from a frequency standpoint. Is that what you're saying, Dave? Um, you know, if if they if those reports and I'm apologize, I haven't had a chance to look at them in detail. But if those reports show data from one day after treatment, two days after treatment, seven days after treatment, and fourteen days after treatment, then they would have met um, the condition. Thank you. I think what this this uh, process points back to is when we do consider a new NOI, we need to be very clear what is required and we need to really understand what DMF wants. But thank you for that, Dave. Mm. Okay, are there any other questions from the commission? Any questions from anyone attending tonight's hearing? Uh, so I see Michelle Nathan. You can unmute yourself you just uh, for the record. Uh, introduce yourself for the record and then please speak. Um, I'm Michelle Nathan. I live uh, very close to Lower Mystic Lake. So I swim always in the upper and lower Mystic Lakes right around the boat club. Um, so a couple observations and then uh, what, a couple of my neighbors had a number of questions. Should I put those in the chat or should I? So just, Michelle, I just uh, wanted to ask if this is part of the uh, certificate of compliance, these questions, or would it be more for the new notice of intent that would permit more uh, in the future? Because that would be our next agenda item. Okay, um, I'm not familiar with all the terminology, so I think so. It's we're trying to close out this permit. So, if there's a reason that you have in that list of things you wanted to talk about that would be something the commission wanted to know about that would prevent us from closing out the permit, then now okay. would be the time to talk. But if it's something about the new permit and what you what you want protections to be added, okay. then that would Is be it... the, the next one. Okay, I guess I'm talking about this one. I mean, that's the only information I have, right? The one that they want to do soon for the herbicides and right. Yeah, signs. one way to one, one way to think about it is if you have comments about what might be done in the future, then please hold those until we get to that oh. discussion item. At this point, we're just okay. looking at things that considering things that happened in the past. Okay, so, yeah. so it would be. Yeah. I guess it would be past then that I'm talking about before you close out the permit. Okay, pass, great, if, thanks. And okay. if I'm not appropriate, just let me know. Sure. Um, so one thing I did talk to about um, a neighbor who did use, I don't know quite how to phrase this, but I'm just giving you my observations. So about six houses have used this company and I understand getting rid of non-invasives. I um, did a lot of reading before the meeting, so I get the point of it. 
Um, but their concern was that reports weren't see received as requested and that they didn't show up when they said they were going to show up. So they ended up using the water company that you use, Water and Wetlands, the one that you mentioned. So they went with them because of those issues. Um, and then one observation I also had was 2018, they requested 43.8 gallons, but 2024 proposal was 4.8 million for the same amount of acreage. So I'm not sure why the big jump. And then I went swimming in both the upper and the lower Mystic Lake. I do that a lot. Um, so what I noticed was, I don't know if any of you came over to go swimming to see what they're talking about. But what I noticed was beyond the roped off swimming area, I kind of estimated 20 by 20 area that does have um, these non, I mean, these invasive plants, because I picked a few of them. Um, and then where the boat launch is, there were also some weeds. And then around the boats, you know, I could swim fine around the boats. I didn't notice any weeds. And then in the upper lake, uh, where there's no motorized boats, um, the kids were jumping off the slide and didn't seem to have any trouble with weeds. I, you know, got close to the short time, but I never ran into weeds, if that's helpful to you. And then... Um, on the lower Mystic Lake, we have a lot of problems with jet skiers and huge wakes. So I don't know how they're going to contain the chemicals. Um, and then the other thing I noticed was uh, we, you probably know we have bald eagles, turtles. We have um, the birders have listed some threatened birds on the lake. I'm not a birder, but I found a list that birders post you know, whether the bird's extinct, threatened, or not, you know, not in harm's way. So I just thought that was important. Um, and then I read about um, plants developing resistance to chemicals. So I wondered if there was evidence where these plants are developing any resistance to the chemicals. And it seems to me prevention as stated in a previous report, makes sense, reducing the fertilizers that lawns use. Um, and then my neighbors had a bunch of questions, and I can put them in the chat if you like, or I could read them to you. So most of those questions <laughs> seem like they would be more appropriate for the order of conditions, although you did make me think that the treatment was effective by saying that you didn't see any uh, invasives when you were swimming around. Yeah, except um, the areas I mentioned. So why don't you hold off the rest of those questions until we get to the uh, um, notice of intent, which is the next thing. Uh, okay. And then we'll we'll go back and get your questions. All right, okay, Michelle. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, yeah, with that, are there any other questions of people who came tonight to talk about this? Uh, Certificate of Compliance. If there are none, back to the commission. Uh, so I have Nathaniel Stevens. Okay. Thanks. Just one question. I'm just looking at our conditions from the last permit. It says monitoring should be conducted between noon and 6 p.m. Uh, it wasn't, and again, I like David, Dave Kaplan, I didn't have a chance to read these in detail, but maybe Susan knows. Did they, did they specify when, what, to what uh, time during the, each day they did the sampling? I skimmed it. I didn't see anything, but I may have missed it. If, if I didn't see that in the tables. Um, mm -hmm. Tanner, could you could you let us know about that? But I didn't see it in the tables. The summary. Um, yeah, I'm 100% not sure. I'll, this is before my time at this company, so mm -hmm. I can't even attest to hoping. I would hope that it was around that time, but I can't confirm that. I'm sorry. Okay. And again, I think this goes to when when we consider a new permit, we have to be very clear what they need to report to us. I thought we were clear, but maybe not. Right. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I guess I'm in favor of issuing a partial certificate, not a full, but that's my two cents. 
what would the partial be? That yeah, they, what would you? That they, yeah. um, What's the reasoning behind it, Nathaniel? Uh, I guess we don't have all the information. Yeah, we don't know if they they haven't shown they haven't shown that they provided the monitor. Yeah, you know, the monitoring is done at that point. But I guess if you know, it's yeah. I don't know. I I guess I'm saying that a, a bit out of frustration because we don't have all the information. But right. what are we going to do? Make them go back and and monitor during those hours? Yeah, you know, I don't know. It it seems like moving on might be with the tighter yeah. or, order of condition. I I. Uh, I was wondering one question, uh, maybe Tanner, you can answer this question, and this might have to do with the, the, our next topic also. But uh, DMF, did they, did you send out and request a letter from DNF? Have you received that? And did they mention some of the stuff that was uh, overlooked and not received? In other words, did they, uh, did they scold you in any way for not delivering what was supposed to happen as far as their 2018 letter? Um, not to my knowledge. I do believe we did submit a letter to DMF. I don't believe we've gotten a complete response back from them because uh, I believe we had kind of gone back and forth a little bit with uh, one of my senior managers and the DMF agent, but I don't believe that it's anything negative as far as like what we did in the past. So I would... I mean, this maybe goes to the NOI, Chuck, but I I would like to see the DMF response. But yeah. that's not for this. I, I don't know if it's, really? I don't know which one it is <laughs> now. Yeah, so this this permit is going to be closed out. There's there's nothing they can do about that. Yeah, I mean, I, we I can choose to so, close yeah. this out. So, but they can't start. You know, the first thing is before we, you know, we can talk about the next permit, but it sounds like that DMF letter would be very helpful to see what tone they strike with, uh, you know, with the company. Solitude, yeah. So I'll make a motion David, to issue a no, certificate of compliance. One second. Um, sorry about that. David, no, you're good. Okay. Can I get a second on that? I'll second. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens, seconded by David Kaplan. Um, Mike Gildas game? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. David White? Yes. And Brian's not here. Um, Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. Dave Kaplan? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Um, I think I got everyone. All right. I so we've. I, I have I a question. Guys? Oh, go oh. ahead. Go oh. ahead, Dave. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to make a, a request to Tanner if there's an ability for him to go back into the field notes from those annual reports that were sent. I mean, when I scanned them, it looked like the dissolved oxygen looked good. You met the one day, two day, you know, seven day, 14 day uh, proposal, whether or not it was confirmed by DMF, we're still not sure. But if you could go back in the field notes and provide the commission the time of day that that those data were taken, I'd appreciate that. Okay, we can make Sorry that. A we can make that a condition to uh, the next order. Yeah, I, th I think you're right because if we want to compare the data to future data points, we're going to want to know when those data were collected, right? Exactly. All right, Susan, did that cover your question? You still have questions. It did. It, it did. I was going to talk about the same things. Thank, thanks, Jane. All right. All right. So, moving right along we have our first hearing, which is the Medford Boat Club. DEP file number 91 dash, do I have this right? 91 dash uh, 363, notice of intent from the Medford Boat Club, the Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing of the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Wetlands Protection Bylaw to consider notice of intent for aquatic management program by the Medford Boat Club located on Mystic Lake. And so uh, Tanner's here again, and Tanner, you're going to have to introduce yourself again for the record, and you can bring the commission up to date with this project. So you, if you have a presentation, that would be, um, this would be the time to present that. No, my name is uh, Tanner Poole, again, uh, Associate Manager of Solitude Lake Management. Um, was this not a continuation from last uh the last hearing it is a continuation of the last hearing um okay. yeah 
Okay, I technically don't have a presentation unless there was one made, but I was not informed of one. Um, I do have pretty much like the comments that were, I believe probably those comments are now or just for the certificate of compliance. But um, pretty much the Metro Book Club is looking to do a, a couple, pretty much like monitoring and if need be uh, on an on-call basis to do herbicide or algae treatments on their two dock areas on the one on upper mystic and the other on the lower mystic lake um uh i know we had a couple uh kind of revisions as far as our uh herbicide like list and that we had too many i know we had we kind of decided to cut that down um we're missing some documents, but I believe we filled all those in. And yeah, I'm, I'm kind of blank. I'm not really sure what else. <laughs> sure. So I, I think the best thing to do right now is, uh, Susan, are you prepared to uh, pull out your, um, you had a letter and we went over that at the last meeting. These were the items that the commission felt uh, that needed to be discussed. And, and Susan was good enough to draft a letter uh, which was discussed with and that's with in the solitude. material yeah. i, I yeah. think that um dave david morgan if yeah. you can get it up because i'm my copy's okay. on a different computer it's hard for me to sure thing sorry but you can go over it right sure and then um actually you could put up the letter that that solitude responded david that would be better because then we have the their responses and my questions, and then Tanner could ask answer questions too, because I have a few more questions from the answers. Bear with me while I pull it up. Okay. And I think we received that on Tuesday. Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday of this week, so I don't know. Right. If it was, it was sent by email. I'm not seeing yeah. it in the Google Drive, but I'm remembering David sent it by email. Right. So I'm not okay. sure if commissioners got to look at it. So it would be good to Tuesday, review. Tuesday, 6.34 p.m. Thanks, Nathaniel. I can screen share it if David can't find it. Yeah, let's go with, let's go with Nathaniel. If so whoever's quickest. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Yep, David's got it. David's got it. Okay, All there. Right. So it's the June eighteenth. Okay, so the um, obviously the, the bolded. Make, yeah. yeah, make that a little bit bigger. A little David, larger, if you can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, so so appendix A was missing was submitted, um. So that's okay, um. And I would just remind everybody. Um, that this is an ecological restoration um, in uh, diadromus, I, I don't know how to say that word, fish run. <laughs> okay. Um, so COC, we did that. So we don't need to look at this number two that we just voted. Um, number three is the proposed NOI request five-year permit. Um, and it looks like solitude and the applicant is willing to do a two-year permit. That was something that was recommended by DMF last time. I don't know if it would be recommended again. We'd have to see what they say. Um, and then number four is the one I wanted to talk about a little bit. The proposed NOI list lists six different herbicides. And, um, I was concerned that there, there were, um, too many, um, and, and this is inconsistent with what the commission usually does, which is um, consider permitting minimum number of targeted herbicides for the invasives that are actually there. Um, so it looks like you narrowed this down to Procellacore for Eurasian milfoil, Diquat um, for curly leaf pondweed, glyphosate and copper algicides. I will say that um, looking at your monitoring reports, you never used glyphosate and you never used Procellacor. 
So I'm kind of wondering why previously you used Diquat. Oh, maybe you did use maybe Aquapro. I don't know what Aquapro is. Maybe you can Aquapro, tell me, Tana. Yeah, Aquapro is a brand name for the glyphosate that we use. So then that was it's glyphosate. Oh, say so you did do a little bit of that. Okay, you didn't do it in 2020. Okay, all right. So previously you used mainly diquat and copper al aldehyde, and. It looks like, I mean, I would love the Water Bodies Working Group to help me with this, but it looks like there are similar invasive species to Spy Pond. So why would we permit different herbicides? But maybe there's a good reason. Um, I can answer that. Uh, so the only reason I would say the only one that's not on previous uh order conditions or NOI is the Priscillacor. Yeah. And the only reason we offer to use Priscillacor is because it provides, it's a systematic herbicide that provides a long-term, a better long-term control of milfoil, at least, mm -hmm. knowing that the pond or the low club has, in the lower end of Mystic Lake, has had milfoil troubles in the past. It was just a better long-term approach. Okay. And we have been um, very hesitant in this commission, and I don't think we've permitted any aquatic management projects with glyphosate in the past, I don't know, five years minimum, maybe more. Um, so can you explain why you need the glyphosate? The glyphosate would only be used in cases of... Uh pretty much the lily pads, kind of just in the area of the dock area or perhaps a swimming area. If it's inside like their boxed in swimming area that they have on the lower end, it would just be used to treat those and just provide a long-term relief of having water lilies in that area. And how is, how is that application done? Um, it's usually done, especially since it would be a small amount, it would be done via a backpack sprayer and we would apply a mix, probably, I would say a one to five ratio of glyphosate to water. And then we also include a surfactant to help stick to the lily pads better. Okay. Just to break in a little bit, um, Tanner, how close is that um, swimming area to the fish ladder? I would say it's a good I believe it's like 250 feet. I think you got a good amount of space between there. Okay. There's a map on the, if you uh, go down a couple pages, maybe you can show on the map the aerial. Let me be helpful. It's where's the swimming area, which side? Um, so the Southern side uh, onto the left of the docks on the southern uh, side. It's kind uh, of where, underneath. Where the, where the right beach where, is, imagine that. Yeah, right where the mouse yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Thanks. Let's see, here's the do you Do you know which way the uh, current goes for around the dock and, and does it go counterclockwise or clockwise um, in that area? Um, around the dock, I would have to say it goes clockwise. Just with the water movement of the, the waterfall coming down right there. So it's all heading towards, if it's going clockwise, it's all heading towards the dam at that point, but it might only get it about mid-channel before it's turned back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nathaniel, your your uh, hand's still up. Is yeah, thanks. Um, okay, sure. David Kaplan was ahead of me. I've been at a comment, but uh, I'd refer to David first. Sure, David. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, yeah, I just had a, a quick comment on you mentioned that you were adding a surfactant to the glyphosate in this proposal, and that's not the aquatic formulation. You want the one without the surfactant. That's the one that's um, toxic to aquatics. 
um, animals and, you know, amphibians. So I, I would just reconsider um, if, if glyphosate is going to be permitted, and I'm not sure it will be, uh, if you use the formulation without. Thank you. And my comment is related to glyphosate can't say it was late, like so fate. I thought Susan did, is there a substitute or maybe Tanner knows? I thought there was a newer, different chemical that was being used in place of it, but I may be confusing my chemistry. Which is... There are some, I, I I still don't understand why, uh, why we need Priscilacor and glyphosate and Diquat. I really think that, I don't know. Yeah. I would agree with you. There's, I just there's, tri that out. there's yeah. tri triclofor, which is used in some places. Um, they all have their pluses and minuses. Dave Kaplan is is right on about the surfactant, though. That makes the glyphosate toxic to aquatic organisms. Um, sometimes when you add another compound to something, it makes it worse um, than it is by itself. So I, I'm still very um, concerned about that. And I mean, I, I would assume we're not going to close this hearing tonight. I would like more information about these herbicide uses. And I would also like to understand what um, the the DMF is, is saying about this proposal, um, because they have much more knowledge than I do on what's going to potentially affect the herring. So... Uh, David Kaplan. Dave has his hand up again. Yeah, yeah sorry. I had a question about um, target vegetation. Did um, and apologies if I missed that. Did you say that curly leaf pondweed was on the list? Is that what the or the diquat is just mainly for the milfoil and possibly the priscilacor also for the milfoil? Um, yeah, curly leaf is. Definitely would be definitely used in play, or excuse me, the other way around. Dicor definitely would be used for the curly. Curly is definitely present at the location. Right. Um, and the Priscilla and the Dicor is also used for milfoil. It just depends on, I guess, how much we find and if it, we dis or if the client and we all come together and decide if it needs to be taken care of more long term, if it's okay and it's not a big area that can be handled with Dicor. Uh, thank you. Well, our, our experience with curly leaf pond weed in Spy Pond was that if you are going to treat it with diquat and you are going to honor the restrictions for the herring run and not apply until June or after June 30th, that at that point, the curly leaf is already senescing. And I think it would, you know, I'd reconsider treatment at that time. It may not be um the best way to manage the curly leaf pond weed so thank you okay so uh i'm gonna take questions from uh steve moore and others that are attending tonight's meeting but the commission if you could get your questions together for um tanner and we could continue this and get answers to those questions so steve uh again you're gonna have to introduce yourself for the record Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, this is not my wheelhouse, and you folks obviously are much better versed in, in the issues and the chemicals involved, but when you mention glyphosate, that is a red flag, and I don't understand why that is necessary here. Uh, again, not my wheelhouse, but um, uh, lily pads are probably just as easily handled mechanically as they would be chemically, uh, but again, I'm talking through my hat, I don't know, but I would never allow glyphosate to be used uh, here because it's been proven, it's been at this point alleged and on the way to being proven how dangerous it is to multiple environments, not just the aquatic, but uh, certainly the pollinators and, and perhaps even uh, avian wildlife. So I just would, I'd flatly say no to glyphosate. Thank you, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Church. Thank you, thank you for that comment. Uh, Michelle and Nathan. Just to introduce yourself for the record again. Oh, thank you. Michelle and Nathan, I live on the lower um, Mystic Lake. So a couple of my questions are still pertinent for this piece of it. Um, 
What is the evidence that plants are developing resistance to the herbicides and algicides? And I agree with prevention measures. I think in the long run, that's more helpful, but I'm not a, an aquatic person either. Um, and I still don't understand why in 2018, 43.8 gallons was used. And now the 2024 proposal is 4.8 million gallons. Uh, just in terms of the lily pads, when I was swimming, I didn't see any lily pads, so I'm not sure why that's even part of the discussion. And then um, I can also um, ask my neighbors questions if I can, if that would work. Not sure, you have a few more minutes. Okay. Um, so, so what are the alternative me methods of removing these invasive species and what are the pros and cons versus the proposed plan? Where has the same approach in a similar body of water been used before? And what were the short-term and long-term outcomes, positive and negatives? What is the half-life of these chemicals and what are the most detrimental effects on the flora and fauna? What are the degrade, de degradation products of these chemicals and what is known about their effects on fauna and flora? Do the chemicals themselves or do any of the degradation products accumulate in fauna or flora? And the last one, after the treatment, what are the long-term plans to keep these invasive species out so that another similar treatment can be avoided in the future? Who is implementing those plans? Who is responsible to enforce such measures? So a, a lot of those will be answered when we finalize the notice of intent, but I suggest with that lengthy list that you just read off that you uh, put in an email and send it to David Morgan. Uh, and then uh, I'm not guaranteeing that you'll get uh, answers to those questions, but at least will be uh, entered into the, to the record. Okay. And what is the email? Uh, uh, David, do you mind putting that in the chat again? All right, Michelle, okay. thank you. And we're going to move on. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And David, you have your hand raised. I wanted to add detail to what Dave Kaplan had mentioned about the use of Dyquat at Spy Pond. So, Last David, time. I would just, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we're only saying that this is going to be continued to another meeting. So, if it's quick, that's great. Otherwise, yeah, it seems good. like we're. We're heading into another meeting anyways. The question that we had about restricting the use of Priscilla for milfoil, uh, it, it pertains to that question. So our experience at Spy Pond was that the application of Diquat also knocked back what we thought was milfoil. And we haven't seen it really appear again. Yeah, Dave can, or David White, you can confirm what I'm saying. So I'm suggesting that maybe we can dial this list back even further. Okay. All right. So at this point, I want to have some questions available for Solitude so they can come back or we could email those questions to them. Just two ways to move forward. Does anyone have their questions prepared at this moment or do you just want to even the commission can email them to David and David can send them off to the applicant. I think we should run through them now and sort of just sending open meeting law concern here is raising a red flag. Um, I think we, I think uh, I and I think Susan and others want to hear get a response from DMF to this to the monitoring reports that have been submitted and then to this particular proposal. I am intrigued by. Uh, was it Mary Nathan's, Michelle Nathan's question about the disparity, the larger amount of chemical that's proposed this time? I suspect that's a typo, but- I, I think would... it's a typo also, okay. yeah. but yeah. they but should I check think... that. Tanner, you should, should check that. That should be checked. Mm -hmm. uh, the other item we want, uh, Dave Kaplan had the good request of finding out when during the day, what time of the day 
to the hour were those uh, samples taken into the, the 2018, 2019, and 2020 uh, monitoring rounds. So we want that information. And that's all that's coming to my mind, but I'm sure others will remember other things we would like. And then I'd, I'd like more information about the proposed herbicides. I'd right. like I'd like to understand the target. My understanding is that there's there's curly leaf pondweed and water milfoil, and not much else usually. And if that's the case, then I would like a justification for which chemicals are for those target species. Plus the copper algae side, which we understand is, you know, in case we get an algal bloom. Um, I would like a, I would like to know if there's an alternate to glyphosate or why glyphosate, an alternate to glyphosate at all. Um, and then I'd like a response for why in, it looks like the final monitoring in 2020 didn't need to use any um, anything, uh, any glyphosate, uh, glyphosate which is Aquapro at all. So um, the diquat did the trick a little earlier in the season, and a copper algicide, um, and then there was no Aquapro, which, as you said, was the glyphosate used at all. So I'd like to look back at that and explain why you think that was the case that year. Um, and whether that's a, that's a good replication. And I see David, Dave Kaplan and Mike Gildas game have their hands up. Thank too. you, Susan. Uh, so I don't know who did it first. Uh, let's call hey. on Dave Kaplan. Uh, I'm deferring to Mike. <laughs> I just have a real quick question about the lilies. And I think that uh, the question is whether or not they are extensive or a minor uh, incursion or a minor uh, population of lilies and whether or not they can be easily harvested by mechanical means rather than um, by uh, by diquat or whatever the other chemical was. Thank you, David. I mean, Mike gets Mike. Okay, now David, David Kaplan, please. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would like to sort of try to translate, I guess, uh, Susan's comments into a request for the applicant if you could please try to put a table together that shows the target species the um, proposed herbicide treatment and the time of year sort of in a neat little table we can I think that'll help us sort of understand um, your management approach thank you okay and with that, Tana, can we uh, would like to get permission to extend this to our next meeting, uh, which would be July 11, 2024? I'm seeing yes. So, okay, from the commission, uh, can I get a motion so moved. to moved? As Nathaniel Stevens, second? Second. Second, Mike Gilders game. Uh, Susan Chapnick? Yes. David White? Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. All right, Tana, thank you. If you have any questions, reach out to David White. And uh, David you could also request the recording <laughs> to review that if you wanted. Oh, well, actually, reach out to David Morgan. No, wow. David Morgan, not David White. Yeah. He reached Patrick out to David. Kaplan He'll just, yeah. We have lots of Davids here. No, just, just email any random David. You know. <laughs> It'll work. Did we get a David of the day over here in Arlington. So. Thanks, Tanner. Good. I'm Thanks. sorry you were you were kind of thrown into this. It seems like you weren't uh, familiar with the project, but you will be. I will be. I will be. Okay. Thank you for your time, board. Yeah, have a good care. night. All right, Tanner. Thank you. All right. I just want to know if someone's here for the 18 Hamilton uh, project tonight. If you could just raise your hand. So Carlton Quinn was on from Allen and Major previously filling in for Jackie Trainer, who was the rep the first time they messaged me to say that they can't get online. Basically, they were on their phone and uh, 
unable to present, so request a continuance to the 11th. There is a thunderstorm going on, if that makes any difference. Could be. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing David due to the rain outside. I lost power too for a while. So should we vote on that, Chuck? Should yeah, hold, hold on. Hearing? I'm just trying okay. to get my uh, thoughts together here. So I, I think that we had a request from the commission at our last hearing. And I know that it had to do with checking out uh, core logs instead of the armored banking that they were going to put um, at the base of uh, any, that, that erosion or that, uh, that reconstructed area. There was a request to understand what vegetation was going to be put into the native planting area. I can't think of the other requests, but I would say that I would like to continue this until our next meeting, which is July 11, 2024, with the caveat that we receive that material prior to our distribution day so we can review it and have uh, you know a discussion and move this project along. Can I list what we requested? Because I had to listen to the recording for the Thank molecule. You. Okay. Sure. So we requested a revised plan, and it should in include um, this the uh, jute instead a consideration of jute instead of the synthetic fabric, um, the quad logs, as you had said, a current picture of the site, and the actual location of a clay pipe which was kind of, or more than one clay pipe. I don't know if there was more than one clay pipe, that was unclear to me. There's a uh, PVC pipe and one or more clay pipes. Right. And um, that was what you requested. Great. I would ask like And to you know officially what... opened the hearing, right, Chuck? Because we kind of like- No, we were, just, we were just having a discussion okay. so we can, okay. we can open, open the hearing, but- uh, the okay. other thing I'd like to know if um, if uh, we can add to find out what and where, what is the source of what's coming out of those pipes? That would be another thing. Okay, so I'm going to officially open the 18 Hamill Place DEP. Conservation Commission is continuing this hearing for 18 Hamill Place. Um, yeah, we just talked about where this project is and the fact that the applicant and their consultants aren't here and we're going to have to continue tonight. So we won't be, we're just going to reiterate the commission's request from our last meeting and take a motion to continue to July 11, 2024. And with that. Second. Second. Uh, David second Kaplan that? and Mike Gildas game. Huh. Nathaniel Stevens. Nathaniel no. and who was second? Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, no Mike it, was, it was Mike Dave Kaplan. Stevens. Yeah. I'm and, set, I'm voting yes. Oh, Dave and Mike. Sorry, I'm trying yep. to take notes. Okay, thank you. And Nathaniel voted yes, and Susan Chapnick. Yes. And David White. Yes. And David Kaplan. Yes. And Mike Gillis game. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, so that's July 11th. David Morgan, I would send him that list and the requirement to have it in prior to the meeting. Will do. Okay, where are we at here? Okay. Uh, so we're gonna open up Thorndike Place at this at this time, DEP file number 910356. This is a continuation of the June 6th conservation meeting. And at that meeting, the commission approved ZVA, CZA as our third party consultant to conduct a review of standards two and three. They will be focusing on um, and reporting back to the commission only on the applicant's submittal. They are free to read any other submittals that is in the record, but we do not want them to or expect them to address any other technical submittals in the response memo to the commission. We have not heard from our third party reviewer, CZA, at this time. Um, and we have not received any of the information and therefore we will need to uh, more time to obtain this review. Uh, and with that, uh, we're, we'll ask the applicant to continue to I'm the- myself again. Bye -bye. Oh, David White is a 
recusing himself. Thanks, David. To the, so we were uh, asking to, for a continuation to the July, July 11th, 2024 hearing. Um, let's see. I, I, uh, Stephanie Kiefer is here, and I don't know if she wants to give permission or I'm looking for anyone else on the project. Hi. Uh, good evening, Hi. Stephanie Kiefer. And uh, I believe Scott is on, but um, I we're fine with a continuance until the 11th of July. Um, and just a correction for the record, it's it's GZA, actually. Okay. GZA. <laughs> right. And uh, we would just uh, ask that as soon as they're um, in, engaged in starting to uh, kindly let us know the uh, that we deposited that check or we delivered that check right away. So anxious to get moving on that. And we think all the efforts to get that to go forward. Okay. I'll make and a motion to continue to July 11th. And then stand a second. Can I get a second? A second. Mike killed this game second. Nathaniel Stevens, Mike killed this game. Back to my list. Um, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. No. No, sorry. David <laughs> White has recused himself. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. This hearing has been continued to the July 11, 2024 conservation meeting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have a request for determination of applicability for 49 Spy Pond Lane. This is an application. I know Susan's doing this. This is an application for work at 49 Spy Pond Lane, and Vice Chair uh, Susan Chapnick will facilitate this discussion. Susan. Sorry, Thank is you. David White back? Yeah, David, are you coming back? You might not have known this is so quick because we want him to be available. Maybe somebody can text. I can text him, maybe. David, here he is. Oh, well, no. Is he? No. Okay. Well, somebody tell me when he comes back because I have to record that as well. Don't know if we can contact him. Here he is. No. No? no I see his picture. I keep, him, I keep his flipping around. His, but... That's his um, like static picture. All right. Um, David Morgan, is there a way to contact him? Maybe you can figure that out. I'm going to continue, though. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. So um, we're, the Conservation Commission is holding this public hearing to consider a request for determination of the ap applicability under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Bylaw for wetlands protection for the construction of a deck at 49 Spy Pond Lane. And those of you that have been with us for a while on the commission, remember that this used to be called 47 Spy Pond Lane lot number one, if you're confused as to what it was um, way back when we originally permitted this project, which has received its certificate of compliance, I believe it was last, last year. Um, so who do we have here for, I see Kevin, who is the, Kevin Blank, Blank Spore, who is the um, owner. And I came for Kevin. Larry, yeah, Larry Cohen. Cohen. Oh, Larry, there you are. Sorry, the little boxes are like all over the place. So, and Larry Cohn, are you going to be presenting for Kevin, the project? Yes, I will. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. You, you're welcome to share your screen. Great. Uh, it's a uh, basic events. Oops. Oh, okay. Um, okay, very good. Um, so my name is Larry Cohen. Uh, I'm a designer with Architect of Suburban Boston. Yeah, we've done many projects in the Arlington area over the years. And Kevin has asked us to design and build uh, a deck on grade uh, at the rear of his house uh, that sits basically right on the lawn uh, of his existing house. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, the deck actually will be spanning over, and you can see this, I hope, in the drawing you know, on the screen. Yeah, it's going to be spanning over uh, an in-ground drainage system that was part of the requirement when the original home was built. Yeah, and this is a little bit more handy. So this is kind of the general layout of the of the framing yeah, and footing plan yeah, that we've prepared. Yeah, 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 and you can see, yeah, what well, when we do this, we'll be using yeah, six steel helical piles, yeah, which I'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar with at this point. Yeah. So it's a very light footprint yeah, that the machine has for pneumatic tires, yeah, so we don't create much disturbance in and out of the property. Yeah. They also go in without basically any disturbance at all. Yeah, but we will be digging a small trench for this these two beams yeah, to sit basically right at grade subsurface. Yeah. You know, that will support uh, the the joists of the deck, yeah, and that is done in a fashion like this. This actually was another Arlington project, yeah. So you can see we dig a small trench, yeah. Hey, hey Larry, I don't, think, I don't think we're seeing the correct drawings right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Right now we're looking we're looking at a picture of the uh, the top decking, not the structural components. Really? You may have to stop share and share on different mm -hmm. screen if you have another view. Yeah, if you have a desktop, a desktop view, that would uh, work. Um, so you have wait. To... Okay. Um, I just have basic. I have advanced. I don't know what that means. Basic layouts. And no, well. Uh -huh. That looks right. Now we're seeing your uh, picture of the uh, framing. Right. So this was a, a prior project that we did in Arlington. So you can see how you know, we've set this beam right into the ground. Yeah, and it's we we like to have crushed stone on either side just for best drainage away from the wood. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the, uh, yeah, the frame will be clad. We're using synthetic decking. Yeah. And that's secured with... Uh, Stainless steel clips that automatically space the decking the three sixteenths inch apart. Yeah, I'm sure it's something you were generally familiar with. Yeah, so it is a yeah, a porous surface. Uh, rainwater will run straight through to the ground. Yeah, we also will be taking up yeah, yeah about you know four or five feet by about twelve feet across of you know, existing pavers that this will go over the area of, yeah, I know some of the committee meeting, committee members you know, were on site this week and, and saw you know, what we intended to do. Yeah. And I don't, if I click on the, you do not see, do you, I'm not sure what you guys are seeing. We're looking at you're the still, framing. You're still looking at the framing. Yeah, new share. New, new share, uh, there we go. No. No. There you go. We got it now. <laughs> got it. Okay. So this is an example. Yeah, actually, this is the decking that uh, Kevin uh, and Lisa chose. You can see it has. Uh, it comes pre-slotted, and that's where the uh, stainless steel clip fasteners go in. Yeah, they have a, a tab on either side. It screws into the joist. Yeah, and the these, yeah, the clips themselves automatically self-space the board. Yeah, we do not expect any you know, of the material to be swelling over time to decrease the spaces. Uh, this type of material will uh, expand lengthwise, but not widthwise. So it's quite consistent and stable you know, over the years. And of course, it's a material that will last indefinitely. Yeah. I suppose it would be best for me to take questions from the board members. I'm sure. I'm well, if you're, sure. If you finished your presentation, you just turn it back to Susan. Okay. So I am going to stop sharing. Is that Thank correct? you. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate that. Um, I have I have a few questions and comments, but I'd like to take questions or comments from the commission first. Okay, I know you want uh, those. 
And we did send some, uh, we did do a site visit on 619 at the site visit was myself, Mike Gildasgame, and Chuck Taroni. We do have some pictures from that. Um, David Morgan, I'm not sure if you could put those up. I think Chuck sent them to you just, yep. just so we could orient ourselves and then ask questions so we could show you physically what the site looks like. David, are you there or are you having trouble? There's been a lot of lightning outside, so yeah. I don't yeah. know what's going on. Maybe. Don't fail on me now. I've been waiting. Really? Till we have a... I mm. know. Sorry. Um, oh, there there's is. David. Okay. David, um, do you think you can put those pictures up? That'd be awesome. And then we can just explain what, what we saw on the site. So so those of you who may not remember um, 47 Spy Pond Lane, Lot 1, Um. This was a lot that that had uh, no house on it, but it did have um, structure in terms of concrete. The closest, the concrete structure, which was impervious, it was an old um, driveway, um, was to the lake was 68 feet. When we permitted this project, um, there was a lot of back and forth trying to pull the, um, pull the, the house back um away from the pond since there was no real structure or house on this lot before and the house was pulled back to approximately 73 feet something like that um the the deck to spy pond if it was constructed would be 60 approximately 66 feet from the pond so a little closer than the original condition, which the commission had concluded was a little, they wanted to see something push back at that time. Um, what you're looking at here is the back of the house and you see the um, tape measure, that's Chuck's tape measure with the red end. That would be the width of the deck. And one of the reasons why the deck has to be that big is to get on the other side of the subsurface stormwater unit that is in there. Because one question we had asked is, can you pull the deck back again, away from the pond? And then it would sit on top of this unit. It has to have some, um, I think it was two feet of separation on the end um, of this stormwater unit. So that's what that picture is there. I don't know if you have other pictures, David. Um, Can you try to um, increase, like, a, just get them a little bit bigger? Well, actually, a lot bigger would be great. So this is looking, we, we had um, permitted um, to have a 25-foot um, revegetation um, buffer right at Spy Pond demarcated by a non-mortared wall. And this is what was built. And you can see it's very successful. They put native plants in there. The wall looks great. You may not be able to see that sign there, but the sign is beautiful. It was made by Kevin's wife. She did it in um, mosaics. It's really great saying conservation area. We saw ducks, geese. Um, it's, it's really um, flourishing um, as a buffer zone. So, so that was very encouraging to see. Um, that was working. Um, and then I don't know if you had any, and this is just showing you if you stand with Spy Pond behind you, um, what this expanse looks like after that 25 foot is basically lawn. There are a few trees we had permitted. Those are on the left-hand side near the fence that's between the two properties. Sure. Okay, so I just wanted to give a context. Yeah, and then don't forget to tell them how far away it is from the edge of the pond. 66 and a half feet. Right, which the decks would be 66 and a half feet. Um, so are there any questions from commissioners? Um, concerns, comments? Chuck has one. Sure. Uh, Larry, I noticed that the framing picture that you showed, um, the support, not only is in the ground, which I had never seen before, but um, it's not straight like your uh, plans show. 
the support you're going to install at 49 Spy Pond Lane will be straight across, right? It won't uh, have that um, peak to it, I guess, when it was what I saw in the framing. Because I'm, again, I'm concerned about the infiltration system. The better footing can actually come forward. So that, that beam can actually be a V instead of straight across, uh, which would put this, that at least that center footing further away from Am I explaining that correctly? I have not. Yeah, I don't know what you're saying, so I guess not. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me share again. And share, share. No, no. I'm trying to share my screen. Chuck, my understanding was that the front edge of the deck towards the pond was curved. Yeah, it, it, but the uh, support so, so, was back. So, so this is this is. Yeah. See, it's not. Right. It's not shaped right. like the one you showed us a picture of. It's straight across. Correct. Right. In this case, it's since it's really the other had a much deeper curve, mm -hmm. there, which there's a maximum that we can cantilever past the beam. Well, I'm not talking about the framing. I'm yeah. talking about the support. Yeah. The support on the right. picture you showed. That's exactly what I'm. That's what exactly what I mean. There's only a certain distance you can go past the beam that's in the ground to the in terms of the cantilever of the joist. Yeah, if it's if it's if it's desirable, this footing can pull forward, mm -hmm. yeah, and the beam would be in a the beam is what you see underneath. Okay. Yeah, that that can be in a V shape rather than straight across. Sure, I I thought it was the one behind uh, where it says deck on grade that was curved, but I I guess no. it doesn't matter if that thing is. Uh, shaped the way I saw that framing picture. So that was that was my question. Thanks, Larry. That you answered. Okay. And I guess the only other I did have another let me I'm gonna stop share and there was one other that I thought you would be interested in seeing. And that was, geez, wish I knew how this was working. Share my screen. Why am I looking at myself? Entire screen. Okay. Are you looking at a, at a, no, we don't not. see anything, unfortunately. Not yet, yeah. Maybe we'll go on to questions while you're looking for that, Larry. Now um, I have to, now I have I to come back to a... That's okay. Um, Nathaniel Stevens and then Dave Kaplan. Thanks, Susan. Gonna... Um, my recollection is when we agreed on the permitting of this, uh, as folks may remember, and maybe I'm suffering from PS okay. PSD, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome on this one, uh, they tried, you know, three times, filed notices of intent or two times, and we denied twice, and then we should reach an agreement with them, and the copy of the agreement is in the file, and in my mind, a very material fact of this was the distance that the, the uh, houses, including the decks, were from Spy Pond, and that that was, we agreed that they would go no further. Um, however, I'm wondering if at that time we were considering decks to be Im impervious surface. I think maybe after that, the commission changed its mind and just determined, decided that it's okay to have a deck because it's uh, pervious and would let the rainwater through. Uh, so I just raise that as a point uh, of discussion because I think that if we're going to if, I guess if we're going to treat decks now as pervious, then I have a little less of a concern. But I do point out that reading the settlement agreement, decks were considered in that context to be part of the structure and they could not come any further. I think even at the time, Scott wanted to make the decks bigger and he just put minimal token decks on, on the house. So uh, I'm thinking that. I also think that given the nature of the work and in the buffer zone and particularly this buffer zone, we would want a notice of intent, but that's my current thinking. I'm, I'm 
I think I'm yeah. open to being convinced otherwise, but those are the two common signs. Uh, Nathaniel, can I ask you just to follow? I'm just stepping on this a little bit. So in the covenant, I asked Susan the same question. It shows a plan. And in that plan, it says red and black. And there's a red line. But I couldn't find where it explained what the red line was. Because as the house is built, that red line is right at the existing deck. And so it seems significant, but it wasn't mentioned. So, red line and i'm looking at this oh here we go uh, i see what you're saying uh, <laughs> the approximate red line i think that was no that's not the buffer zone I, and now i see those i have to, have to think about that i think the red yeah i don't know what the red line is oh. yeah i didn't get to go back and look at my notes from 2018 i have extensive notes on this i get and, PTSD from this project too it's so curious that you have to go back like, i don't remember. Yeah. I think you know, it's why? curious that it's right there at the edge of, uh, I don't know, development, pervious surface, decking, you know, all that. So I, I thought it was significant somehow, but couldn't find a reference to red line. Yeah. I'll, I'll read the, I'll scan the agreement now. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to go to Dave Kaplan while you're reading that, Nathaniel. Dave? Um, thank you. Um, I just had a question about I mean, is the stormwater management system that you plan to build over, is that, you know, that is that rated for the loading that you're proposing to put on it? Or, you know, is it is it going to be any any way material materially impacted by the structure on top of it? There should be no load on that at all. We're, we're spanning over it. It's supported in front of it and behind it. Yeah, so that we are not resting on that system whatsoever. Okay. And I and I guess this may be for one of the commissioners who was part of the project. I'm I'm looking back at the settlement agreement and the map or the plan on there, and it shows the proposed infiltration chamber sort of perpendicular to the house. And and did they make a change and now it's sort of parallel to the back of the house? Bringing Somehow it that one. Yeah, that's for a uh, lot, the other lot, the one that's along the house, two houses almost in between them. We saw that there also. Okay, so am I, I'm looking at the, the wrong lot on the plan. It's, it's not lot one. Where... It is lot one. It is lot one. Okay. There is an as built. Are you looking oh, at the ad bill, No, no, I'm system. sorry. I'm looking at the plan and the settlement agreement that has the red line and black line. So I guess the, there was a change, but I it was a bit of a change of where the mm -hmm. I think where the, but I do on that same vein. Before I go to David White, if you'll wait a minute, David, because we're on the stormwater, there is a requirement in the order of conditions for maintenance of the stormwater condition, and it basically just says do maintenance inspection and it says either once or twice a year based on manufacturer's suggestion of what to do i don't know what that inspection would be because there's no port or anything but then my concern is if you put a structure over it how would you ever inspect it if you're supposed to inspect it and should someone investigate should it be inspected based on what was the manufacturer's instructions? Because we didn't get details in our order. Yes, Chuck? Yeah, let me just say something to David Kaplan. David, there's, so from the pictures, there's a picture in the, and some of the material that we got, you can tell that there's no, there's not two feet of cover over this. So it's not, um, there's no carrying capacity because all these systems need at least two feet of cover from what I uh, have, gained over the years about these systems. So it's very shallow, like six inches. So I think that maybe a condition would be to make sure that in between those two support, that there is no lawn touching the bottom of the support if we were to pass this. And secondly, on the infiltration system that seems to be in between the two houses, there is a clean out there. It's above ground, it's um, PVC, and it's that turquoise color. Uh, and I think if you check that out, you would see uh, some sort of cap. Uh, and then the last point is on this infiltration system, there is a way to find it. 
and you could inspect it, but you would have to dig a little bit to uncover the the cap and 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 then just put a flashlight in there and see what's going on. There's there's also no um, so leaf debris from the gutter is probably the main problem here, and there's no overflow on the downspouts. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Chuck. David White. Um, just going back to decks, it depends on construction whether they're pervious or not. Some modern decks are solid or not pervious, just to make that note. I, I will note that we looked at a wide variety of, of kind of building options here from patios to different types of decks. Uh, and this is pretty much the most permeable thing, you know, constructed as far as I can tell. There's no concrete pour. It's helical steel posts. Uh, there's guaranteed spacing between the beams. So I think in terms of permeability, this is about as good as you can get. Okay, just a note that, yeah, that's, decks do vary. Thank you. Um, I was concerned about the deck, too, because I think a pivotal part of this and I think Nathaniel hit on it for, for those of us who lived through the, the first iteration um, of permitting is that decks were, we considered decks impervious surfaces and they were structures and they were structures located closer to Spy Pond, which is why we pulled it back, which is why Kevin, unfortunately you have these tiny little kind of useless decks um, because that's all we, we permitted. Um, that said, there has been some re more recent history of the Conservation Commission to determine on other projects that certain decks were pervious, um, therefore allowing them to be in certain locations where we may not have permitted oh. them previously. So that's something we need to consider. Um, yeah, Susan, I, I'm wondering... First off, my recollection of us making that determination when this project came in front of us, I don't have that determination. I think it was purely a demarcation line where they were not allowed into the aura. And my argument was, why? Why are we doing this? And you mean we why kept, are we limited it? Is that why, what you're saying? Why did we maintain? Why did we maintain um, the discussion about keeping those decks that are attached to the house so that are on the first and second floor above ground you know four feet or three feet or whatever we said it was hardly a useful deck at all i remember us going back and forth but there was a line that the commission didn't want to cross these are raised decks above the ground has nothing to do with light or permeability because that that wouldn't really matter but there was that line and the and so i don't remember anyone saying well let's to make a determination that these are pervious or impervious. Um, they but... were considered structures and we didn't want the structure. We wanted to push the structure back as far as we could. And actually I went back to the minutes, Chuck, and you were very, vo um, you were voicing your opinion that there shouldn't be any building here at all, that there wasn't mm. enough mitigation and it really shouldn't go in. Um, it wasn't specifically about the deck. It was about the whole project. Um, but I think it was a compromised position. I don't remember all the details on it, but that it might have been early on in the structure. discussion. It was it was the final permitting. Um, yeah. Minute. So, but anyway, it, yeah. it it was considered a structure. Um, yeah. So what was that? What was that vote? That we did we make a vote that it's a yeah, structure? Yeah. So the vote then... that permitted this was, um, I think. Four, one, one. So four in favor, one abstain, and one no. But that was the the whole the whole approval for the entire project for this where, for this lot. Where, where was the vote one. that the but the that the decks were structures? Was there a separate vote for that? No, I'm just I'm just just I'm just making that assessment that the that that's why we pulled everything okay. back because the decks were part of the project and that. They were 73 feet or whatever they were. Yeah, my recollection yeah. about this yeah. project is that yeah. I was not in favor of it, but I did have comments about the deck, and the comments were a small deck was ridiculous, but 
uh, the commission felt like that was that was uh, where they wanted to draw the line. So I'm just wondering if we're going to allow this now, why didn't we allow it before? And why can't we allow it in the future? Good question. Mike Gildas Game, you have your hand up. Yeah, I guess the question I have, seeing that was not on the Conservation Commission when this first came up, is do we currently think of decks as structures? And if not, uh, looking at the permeability of the of this structure, if you want to call it that, uh, is there something in our regulations that would preclude this based on permeability? Yeah. I don't see how it couldn't be a structure, whether it's permeable or impermeable. It's a structure. So that probably wasn't the, I mean, did it say it in the minutes? I'm not sure. We were probably deciding on whether it's permeable or not. Um, Nathaniel and then David. Nice. Moore. Yeah, I'm just skimming meeting minutes online briefly and, and, and also racking my brain. My recollection was the yep. real focus was on the impervious surface because when it was 47 Spy Pond Lane was presented, the developer subdivided it. The existing lot conditions, there was a house on the eastern, oh, sorry, uh, yes, the eastern side, and then it had a huge driveway. So we tried to get the developer to reduce the size of the it, or, or sorry, when he redeveloped to have equivalent or less impervious surface. And I think that was the focus on that. I don't think the focus at that point was whether a deck was uh, pervious or not. I think we, we, I guess, I think we implicitly decided that, that it was impervious just based on the drawings that I've seen and remembering that the primary concern was the amount of pervious and impervious surface uh, on the on the on the uh, in the buffer zone too, and the other other concern was keeping things at a distance. And I believe that red line. My recollection is that red line is something that I sent to Scott Seaver to say, "Look, at this is the red line." Don't he called it the red line? Don't cross that line. And we compromised with 49. If you if you look at that line, it goes through the house, but you'll see that there's an area to the upper right that's about the same size as the house. So instead of making the house wall, you know, follow that red line, we said, okay, fine, just bisect it. So it's equal area above and below. So we're you're essentially maintaining the pervious, uh, impervious surfaces. So I think that's my recollection that that's what that red line is about. Thank you, Nathaniel. David? Can I add something? Oh, sure. Larry? Yeah. The two decks the that are at the back of the house both have finished ceilings on the underside, which to me means that they are not a porous surface. Right. Otherwise, they would just be water pouring through the ceiling all the time. Right. You know, so that's that's different than a normal open deck with just open joists yeah, and water flowing through it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. We don't have the, we had the architectural plans at the time. I'm now remembering, but we don't. I don't see them in the file at the moment. But you're, yeah, that could be why you're right. That could be why we had labeled yeah. those as uh, or considered them impervious. David Morgan. So, whatever we've decided about this previously, our current regulations would confirm that the definition of structure covers a deck. It yes. doesn't explicitly name it, but it would definitely. It is a structure. That it is a structure. However, looking at the definition of pervious surface, we decided that decking shall be considered pervious material, provided one of the following soil types are below the decking. The class one, two, and three soils as defined in state law um, and that's based on the USDA's classification um, so I don't know what kind of soils we have on site but um, there are criteria in the current regulations to guide that decision. What section is that David? So I'm looking at the definition section. The def so that's section four. Thank you. I believe so. Yeah, it's number 62. Okay. Thank you. 
Mike, guild schemes? Yeah, I wonder if those soil types actually apply here, given that you've got a stormwater infiltration system very shallow underneath the proposed decks. So I'm not sure that the soils really count for much here. I and those infiltration systems don't take rainwater soil, don't they only take the rain roof rainwater from pipes? But it's covered, the structure, the stormwater structure is covered by lawn and dirt. Right. But they're also, they're surrounded by uh, three quarter to inch and a half uh, crushed stone. So that area would be quite pervious. Okay. So given the number of questions that have come up and comments, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if this is should be an NOI and not an RDA. I, I don't know what other commissioners think. Um, it's Well, Susan, I'm trying to understand what the concerns are at this point specifically on this deck in terms of how our regulations or DP apply here. I maybe need more specificity because I'm not entirely clear. I think there's there's a few things. One is it is it pervious or impervious? And as you may know, though they're not regulations yet, the draft DEP update considers decks impervious. They're not promulgated. So we can make our own decision on that, but it's something to consider. Um, and the second one is what is required based on the decision, prior decision of this project, um, because it was litigated so heavily, I think we have to take history into consideration on this site. We can't just pretend nothing ever happened here and we're just looking at a new deck. I, I feel that way. Maybe maybe that's not appropriate. I can ask Chuck or Nathaniel if they feel that that's appropriate. I yeah, Nathaniel. I I would say um, lost my train of thought. I I think that um, that we could look at the um, the stormwater what is the stormwater standards or whatever so so back in the old no, notice of intent we had the stormwater report and that would tell us what the soil types are but it's likely up up soil is probably very pervious so i'm sure that it would be okay um and meet those standards so it, i guess under the regulations it would be a pervious deck um, but we could check into that. I mean, that would be something else to say that, yeah, there's more time needed to look into more information. I think that the past history is, um, yeah, I asked this out at the, out of the meeting. If we, if we didn't allow it when this was built, why are we allowing it now? And I said, for instance, in Reading, we treat homeowners differently than we do um, contractors. There's tougher standards for the contractors. And so therefore, something like this would be looked at differently, even though the, the uh, contractor couldn't, couldn't extend the deck into this area, into the 60 foot six, 66 and a half foot area. So I don't know what allows it here in Arlington, but I think that you would also need to look into the regulations that are regarding the aura and uh and what happens in that area and the fact that we're supposed to push all work as far out of it as we possibly can and and also consider an alternative analysis which we didn't we it is hard to ask for under an rda process okay nathaniel you have your hand up and then david morgan um david morgan had his hand up before me Thank you, David. I was going to chime in with my two cents on the historical uh, fact finding here. I, having looked at the settlement agreement and the old permit and found really nothing binding in terms of the decision about placement, that, you know, that's one of the reasons that I think that an RDA is appropriate here and also that the um, the work is fairly 
limited, of course. So I would personally set aside some of the history, given that there's nothing really material, I think, to the decision about the new deck. I do hear Chuck and Susan's point, though, about the aura and the alternatives analysis. I think we are we could be more consistent with our application of that standard uh, under NOIs. And uh, I don't know that similarly positioned applicants would have been required to do an alternatives analysis for a deck. My two cents, go ahead, Nathaniel. Thanks. Um, First of all, uh, respectfully, Chuck, I think I'd like to dis distance myself from your comment that we treat d uh, developers differently from homeowners. I would like to think that we treat all applicants. You misunderstood same. me that I said in Reading. Yeah. I said in Reading. Okay, thank you. We're in Arlington. Thanks. <laughs> okay, good. I don't remember writing that in the regs. Just to be clear on the record on that. Um, but thank you, David, for your uh, perspective on that. Again, I think if we are to, if the commission is now considering decks to be uh, pervious surfaces, I think I'm more comfortable with this proposal than I would be otherwise, because again, it's going over lawn, it's going over, going over and uh, stormwater infiltration structure. It's not as if they're asking to remove trees and vegetation. And we have the vegetated buffer, 25 foot vegetated buffer demarcated by a stone wall there and it looks to be well maintained. So I, I think I, I I could unshackle myself from the, the history of this project a bit and um, and approve it. But I th I'm leaning towards Susan to say that I think that we do need, we probably do need uh, an NOI for this, for the reasons that she cited. That's my current thinking. <laughs> Dave Kaplan. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nathaniel. I agree with uh, a lot what you said, but it's, it's the same, um, but and not but, but and. I guess I'd feel more comfortable with this project too if there was some mitigation proposed building into the resource area. Lawn's not the best habitat, but it is habitat, and and changing that into a enclosed structure space. Um, to me, sort of uh, lessens the resource area values, and I'd like to to see some sort of mitigation proposed um, for it. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. That's a good point. Um, any further uh, comment, Larry? I have two things. Um, one, as far as mitigation, we are taking up uh, a nice section of uh, hardscape patio. Yeah, that the deck's going over, so there is some you know, give back you know, to get what we we'll get what we're looking for. Yeah, my other question is about you know, you know, if there's a is if indeed there was you know, litigation and, and and an NOI when the property was built, whether there was any sort of deed restriction, which is normal in a NOI. Yeah, you know, and if so, what does that say uh, about you know? the outcome of the conservation committee at the time. So the deed restriction, I think was in the materials. Um, and what it basically says is that all pervious surfaces need to remain pervious. That's kind of the big deal. So if that's the case and we consider a deck impervious, then you could not build it. If we consider a deck pervious, then we could consider building it. It's not it's it, it's okay with the deed, but we can decide if it's harmful to the resource area to build it or yes. not. Yes. Right. Okay. But right now, it is considered a pervious structure by state reg. Am I am I correct? No, the commission's the, the commission's the gone back and forth one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Bill yeah. the. What what the building code may say about it does not determine what how we view it under the wetlands bylaw or the wetlands protection act. So some commissions consider it pervious, some consider it impervious. As David White said, it kind of sometimes depends upon the construction. 
so yeah, there's no there's no clean answer. So my, my question, my question would be, does the commission consider this proposed deck pervious or impervious? That's and the I, question. Yeah. And I think that well, from what I understand of the proposal, uh, where you have three sixteenths inch uh, spacing between the uh, the boards, I, I no. don't know how that by itself is rated pervious or impervious. But it seems to me, having lived with a deck myself for quite a while, uh, that as long as the uh, spaces are regularly cleaned and maintained that it is a pervious surface. So that's just my own experience, but I don't know how that fits in with the commission's feelings. Thank you. Yeah, so I I would okay. wonder, am I good? Yeah, I would wonder if um, the discussion about pervious and impervious has more to do with um, like a restored area. And because, you know, we're talking about a deck and we're wondering, hey, is it impervious? But also, does it allow light to go through? Does it does it have value, habitat value underneath it? We're losing, if there was, if pervious meant more than just allowing rainwater through it, we're losing all those other things, light, habitat, vegetation, um, escape cover. It's basically set on the ground and you're blocking off that whole area except for the rain going in it so at least i would like some time to look to look into that to try to figure out you know what are we talking about just simply water dripping through something or is there more to it um nathaniel thanks uh following up with what chuck was saying my recollection as i'm as my memory is being jogged about this whole project, is that there was a fair amount of testimony from neighbors about the wildlife in the area, even using the lawn area, as we were, as those commissioners who were here at that time. This lot was uh, pretty much a house pavement and lawn, and we had a lot of testimony and photos, I recall, from neighbors saying, look, even if it's lawn, it is being used by uh, different wildlife, and it, lots of pictures. So I think Chuck's point is well taken and supported by the record at, at the time. So. Thank you. And and actually, I, I, I mentioned to Kevin at the site visit, you know, I feel for him. He bought this house. He doesn't know the history. He wants a nice deck for his family. Um, but this was an empty lot and it had some value um, to, you know, habitat, wildlife, um, buffer to the to to the uh aquatic resource spy pond and yes we got a really nice 25 foot revegetation zone and i will say that that the owner is being a really good steward of that and i, I appreciate that i think we all do um but we do have to consider our regulations and our regulations say we are concerned about what happens within 100 feet um up a hundred foot of the of spy pond that we consider that that whole area very important and that's what we're struggling with um even if we consider it a permeable surface it's a very large intrusion to what is there right now in my opinion. i actually think it might be worth throwing the photographs up again there was one that okay. showed uh you know the view from spy pond looking at the house and you can kind of see where we're standing because it's okay. actually my guess is we're talking about less than 10 percent uh, of the area behind the house and it is you know 50 to 60 feet back from the water and it's a, you know a small fraction of the width of the lot too so i, I actually think this is um if you if we had a better photo of the whole property, you'd see this is uh, a really small delta, but you can capture it. Yeah. So if you look at this photograph here, um, you know, the, the width of the deck is really uh, from the doors, the, the doors in the bottom level. Uh, so the width of those doors to this post. Right. So it's pretty small. It goes back to about where we're standing. Uh, it does, actually does not go any further than where the people in this picture are standing. So, you know, you're talking about a pretty small. A chunk of that area and we are 
you know, we, we, we appreciate the wildlife as well. It's thriving. Uh, there's a lot of activity back there. We love it. So I think, you know, we totally agree and, and, and get the concerns, but this is, this is not into anything significant. And, you know, most of that activity is not where we're talking about, you know, where you see the people standing in this photo, that's most of the deck. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I feel like the impact's very small. Thank you. Um, can, can you remind me the, the square feet of the deck? Like, it's, it's, uh, remember that 20 feet by 18 feet. 20 by 18. Okay. Thank you. Nathaniel. Yeah, I think, uh, this discussion to on my mind begs begs the need for a notice of intent. So we have that information. We have more of a site plan that shows this uh, so we can see it. Is that right? do, do the math and things like that. Uh, I, you know, again, if, if, if we assume that this is, yes, if, if the commission considers this to be pervious, the deck pervious, I've, uh, I've uh, I agree with Dave Kaplan that this would be easier to swallow if some additional mitigation was proposed. So that's where I'm leaning, and I'm also more leaning towards the notice of intent for this. Um, Especially if we want to consider mitigation in the aura, it's hard to do that on our argument. Yeah, so I'm going to make a motion to issue a positive determination of applicability under the bylaw and the, uh, and the Wetlands Protection Act. I second. And without, but without confirming resource area boundaries. Chuck, do you still second that? Yeah. I still second that. Okay, I have a vote and a second. We didn't open it to public comment, though. We needed to do that, Did, didn't we, before we voted? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, sorry about that, Nathaniel. So hold that thought. Yep. I'm going to open this up for public comment. Is there anybody in the public who would like to comment or ask a question about 49 Spy Pond? Lane, you can raise use your uh, raise hand reaction button. Um, I don't see anybody. Do you see anybody? Am I missing? I don't see anybody. Okay, I'm closing public comment. And Nathaniel, if you would make your motion again, please. Uh, sure, I make a motion to issue a positive determination of applicability, but not confirming the resource area boundaries, meaning that we've determined that there's jurisdiction under both the bylaw and the Wetlands Protection Act, and that the proposed project requires the filing of a notice of intent. And I'll second again, and... Um... Nathaniel, I know you said that you weren't going to confirm the wetland boundaries. Do you think that a wetland uh, a wetland scientist is needed here to re? No, no, and okay. I'm sorry, and, and that may be okay. sur that may be superfluous uh, verbiage. I just can't remember because whatever the note, whatever the RDA asked for. Well, sorry, let me just go back to that. I should rephrase that better. Sorry, they are just asking. Why am I missing the page that says they're asking? What are they asking for? A request for it's at the, at the last page somehow. Like the the permit seems to be. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So different. I can't find it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's a new form. Oh, wow, a different form. Okay, so yes, they're asking whether the area depicted on the plans is area subject to jurisdiction under the act. Yes. Okay. Um, oh right. Yeah. So Chuck, they are asking whether boundaries or resource areas are accurately delineated. So I will say that we're not not making a determination about that, but we are we are making a positive determination that the area is subject to jurisdiction under the Wetlands Protection Act and under the wetlands uh, bylaw and that the activities depicted on the plans are subject to the Wetlands Protection Act and bylaws and uh, uh, and regulations and bylaws. But we are not making a determination as to whether the boundaries are accurate. But, and, I'll, and I'll second that again. Well, sorry. OK, I'm going All to right. a vote on that motion. Mike Gildeskane. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. David White. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And I say yes. So Kevin and Larry, this means that you need to refile this as a notice of intent. Um, and 
David Morgan can help you with that if you don't understand how to do that. And you, you'd have to, because you're working in the adjacent upland resource area, which is a jurisdictional resource area that we protect in the town. It's also the 100 foot buffer to spy pond under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, you will have to do an alternative analysis and may, and as you've heard us request from our concerns, um, think about some mitigation that can offset um, the deck in this area. Um, and David Morgan can help you decipher our wetlands regulations if you need that. So I know this isn't the outcome you requested. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we we have to implement our regulations the way we um, interpret them and protect the hundred foot from this from spy pond. So okay, thank you. Okay. And I would just I would just add to the application. I think in my mind, I don't think you need a survey plan. No. Uh, the uh, other commissioners may differ, but I do think we need a, 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 some sort of schematic showing the distance of the edge of the deck from Spy Pond the, and approximately where the resource area is fine. I mean, fortunately, you have the survey plans from the prior application, so maybe it's just a matter of modifying modifying those, marking those up. I have that. Okay. okay right, and yeah. what this process allows us to do is if we do get to the point where we're we vote to 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 put some conditions on this to allow this to go through because we put conditions that will offset any negative impact that we interpret from this structure. So that's what it allows us to have the leeway to do. What are some examples of those types of conditions that you may ask for? So mitigation plantings, so additional um, plantings, um, aside from what you have in the 25 foot, maybe even in front of them. Plantings are a traditional mitigation activity. Um, I don't know what are some some of the other ones, Chuck. There's a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of planting already. I, I think that um, you could look at that and you could see if any improvements could be made if there's invasives growing in and you could remove those. I saw a lot of I saw a floating log out there. And there was a bunch of turtles on it. So I would ask that you look into creating some more turtle habitat out there just near the dock or beyond the dock. I don't know if you have a right to do that, but I think that would be interesting also. Um, that wouldn't take up any more of your lawn. I really feel like you've you got that 25 foot. But looking at both those two things, what's in there, how it can be approved, and then maybe some turtle habitat. There's also a third step you could take. You could look at the bank, and if it's eroding, um, it, that that might be a little bit more uh, of a notice of intent also. But you could look at the bank and see if there would be any suggestions that came up with that. You know, no erosion's a bad thing. And if you could David stop that from happening. You. David can help you with a lot of that as well. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Good thanks, night. Larry. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it looks like uh, this was the last thing on our agenda. If anyone um, attending tonight's meeting has something to say, just raise your hands raise one of your hands or use the raise hand function in the reactions button and we can listen uh, to what you have to say at this moment. If not, I'll ask the commission if they have any other topics they like to discuss. And if that's not the case, I'd like to Mike, adjourn. Is Mike, plus oh, Mike, are you? Sir? Yeah. Well, I was just gonna uh, offer a motion to adjourn. Okay, good. Uh, note that uh, July 11th, I will not be present at the commission meeting. Sure. Anyone else who won't be at the July 11th meeting? I won't be at the following two meetings, it turns out, unfortunately. Okay. 
May I suggest that we send um, the meetings we're going to be missing this summer due to vacations to David Morgan so he can check for a quorum because there's going to be one or so I'm missing as well. Oh. Yeah, so Nathaniel's missing the 11th and the 25th. No, he's no, here the he's 11th. Met, oh, it's the 25th and the and the. That's why I oh say we need to send them to David because it's going to get confusing. I'm not going to check my. I'll, I'll start. I'll start an email right now. I've got my email. Yeah. Thanks, Nathaniel. Are we meeting the 25th and the first, like the very next week? I believe. Yeah, I believe so. That's what's. That's what got me screwed up because I didn't realize that. I'm making okay. a recommendation right now. This is a good thing that I'm chair. I'll tell you. That might we'll eliminate. They have to meeting. cancel one of those meetings. Chuck. <laughs> yeah. <Hopefully laughs> All right, we can, can talk about it. Things will work out. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn, Mike? I think you did that. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, just wave of hands. Okay, would be fine with okay. me. Unanimous. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.